Do eight hours, please. Let's please not do eight hours of this nonsense. <laughs> we are on air. Hello, people. How are you doing? Welcome. I'm here with James P. Dowling. James P. Dowling, please tell us what is up with yourself. How are you doing over there? No, I'm life. excited. I'm excited to begin our new endeavor together. Surprise, surprise, I'm not sick of listening to you yet. So that's the highest compliment I could ever possibly give you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, James, I'm just going to do a bit of screen sharing here because speaking of compliments, I want to talk about the English people <laughs> a little bit. So it, I'm For really God's think... sake, this nine month old joke. It's like some disabled baby that just needs to be birthed and get on with its miserable little life. This this is this is just brilliant. This oh, is just brilliant. Sake. <laughs> <laughs> so um this is actually quite topical because we're going to talk about the genealogy of <laughs> the genealogy of morals. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how <laughs> human societies have organized together as groups in order to create the idea of morality. And this is Nietzsche's probably you could say one of his most punchy most profound and most crazy work so we're, we're, we're going to run through this i'm going to roll the presentation and james is going to give us his, his plenty of his thoughts and um but first we must sort of set the stage by showing a very specific tribe in northern england i'm gonna say is, is that meant to be a northerner because that is so spot on <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, this is i think i saw this on 4chan yeah i saw this on 4chan i pulled a load of um i pulled a load of the memes up because i could not believe how funny it was because it's it's the north englanders mate you know yeah he's, <laughs> he's probably called dave or mike or something like that. all he does is he goes to the pub and watches uh, manchester united i know them well north fc you mean you fucking... north, north fc mate yes you fucking nonce. <laughs> <laughs> so a brief history of the north of north of England, right? And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna discuss how um this this particular tribe, um, which is James's tribe, it must be noted. This is James. Like you're sort this of is seeing not my James. Tribe. I hate the northerners, they're all plebs. You gotta have to have a proper posh boy like me. <laughs> but see, James lives in the north, so he he's saying that quote unquote, but he actually he loves the north. He's that's why he went there, and he's actually just a southern southern twat. You know, that's all he is. So he, he's going up there. So I love this because I'm I'm going to start some infighting among the British now, and then they're going to start fighting each other, and that's divide, and then the next strategy would be conquer. So um, this is a brief history of Northern England. Let's see what's going on. <laughs> this, is, this is back. This is back when. Uh, <laughs> This is back when the, the, the Romans were here. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to try read this. This is actually really hard because this is a hard accent, right? Proper nice wall, mate. <laughs> My old man used to be a builder. Tribe used to call him Bob the, the Bricky. Fastest Bricky in the tribe, me old man was. You know, maybe I could get a lives together and we could have a help you finish, mate. We take... <laughs> <laughs> we say cash in hand and uh, you know no need to let no adrian know about any of this you know uh, <laughs> emperor's tax and all that none of that around here mate ha <laughs> oi you got any sheep for sale mate love a good sheep mate how's the war going anyway mate you killed any southern cunts recently Woden's bollocks i fucking hate those southern muppets but yeah about the war should i, <laughs> should I get hold of terry now we can start getting some mud mixed up straight away. <laughs> oh my god, it's Terry as well. They're always called Terry. That's so spot on. I like this this thing about southern cunts. I really like that because that's you, you know. There's also uh, this look of just sheer terror on the the Romans. And this is uh this is the, I, to be honest, right? We're gonna get into this later, but this is uh this is probably these Northerners are probably more related to the Irish than they are to well, southern well, southern well, well, twats like above um, Hadrian's Wall, the Scottish more so yeah. than just the north of England. They they were known as like the Scots Gales, so um yeah, the Scotia. Ireland was called Scotia before it was. So so in some sense, this is me. Like you can see the Braveheart tattoos. This is this is Celtic culture right yes. here. So. Yes, I like the yellow teeth as well. That's a nice touch. <laughs> so I think, I think this is more me than you. But for for now, I'm I'm definitely blaming you. This is this is James's soul right here. So, <laughs> so then the fuck off Saxon. <laughs> so then the Anglo Saxons come and they they conquer the north. So the 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 Romans don't manage to do it. They have to build a wall. But then the Anglo Saxons come and they they move over the blondes, the sovereign cunts as they're called, and then they establish their tribes. They establish a foothold in England, and this this is actually super relevant to what we're going to talk about. Unbelievably relevant to what we're going to talk about later. So, um, these are the invading Germanic tribes, and they they get the Norths, and then they turn the Norths into English people. 
And then uh, the English people, they start to adapt to this new reality that they have. And they become sort of Northern Englander, Englanders as opposed to a separate race. And you can see uh, you've got this little flag up here and you've got Greg's. And you, you'll know about Northern England culture. This Greg's. is where James... This is where James hangs out. <laughs> and then we have a Venetian diplomat who says, the English are all great lovers of themselves and of everything belonging to them. They think there are no other men but themselves and no other world but England. <laughs> I agree. I agree with that. And then this 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 uh, warrior instinct that they, they had, it remains to this day. This territorial instinct remains to this day. <laughs> Here's um, the Norths are the pinnacle of creation. For them, the great struggle is won. They've evolved a society which knows no stress or angst. Who are, who are we to judge them? We Anglos who have failed. Or the Americans and the road to ruin in their turn. And why? Because we sought answers to questions that a North wouldn't even bother to ask. We see a culture that is strong and despite it as crude. His William name is definitely Terry. You can tell that guy's name is Terry. Um, William, William, yeah, this dude here, yeah, yeah. And so, what happens interesting is as the <laughs> Anglo's uh, subjugated the Norse and integrated them into their society, the, the Anglo Saxons they actually brought the Norths all around the world. So you have the Norths <laughs> on ships and suddenly becoming the colonists over the whole world. <laughs> And so suddenly, in this strange twist of fate, you had these like somewhat irrelevant, beyond the pale, um, northerners and Scottish tribes. They not, they are now like conquering the entire earth. And so now you see the the world map of the north. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, what 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 we got? We got the Yank Wankers. Yeah, I like that one. I'll, Canada I'll get... or Summit. I love the 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 Welsh sheep nonces. <laughs> Yeah, Southern pufters, <laughs> Polish cants, fucking EU, poor cants, poor guy, continental, pa packy, packy bastards. Yeah, packy. that's a classic one. I love this one from Middle East. It's like not racist, just don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> that is spot. That's spot on for all things. Oh man, and then Japan is nonce cartoons. <laughs> nonce is essentially just a, a a slur word for anything that's kind of posh. Kraut nonces. So they had this problem then because they took over the world that these nor these Norths, these and then they now consider their identity to be English, which is interesting. And again, it's going to become relevant. So they consider themselves uh f fucking IRA. Fuck. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> notice that one, the fucking IRA. Um they took over the world, but then something very interesting happened. Oh yeah, sorry. So yeah, they they have this as well. F Fat cunts, classic steak and kidney, <laughs> fucking lush with some chips and a pint, just like mum used to make them. Go on, son, have a cheeky nosh. <laughs> fucking North <laughs> FC one ten eight. <laughs> Happy days. Important. Don't eat the tin, you daft cunt. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not actually just the North of England that does this. It's the um. Uh, what we used to call the common folk and I, I'm not rich it makes me sound like I am but it was the northerners and the common people is what it used to be and they've gradually infested the south as well so everywhere I've gone these um these these degenerate louts have also followed as well they kind of just leave a bit of a distaste in your mouth <laughs> no 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 they're just you know they're the essence of decadence they're just a disgrace um, yes, and this this is something I will get into. Like this is what I want to bring up in this next section of this book because this is actually so unbelievably poignant and a it's brilliant. Not really way. though, is it? I swear to God, dude, you're going to be this current picture on the screen. Fat cunt's I well, like this, like a kidney. The the trend of the stories that I'm going on about is super important. It's super important. It really illustrates it well. Um, but I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm actually doing it because it's just a brilliant piss take. Um, oh yes, and then we must pay respect to the wham. And I, there was a few of these pictures showed up. I was like, wow. And but they, this comes with uh this desire to leave the EU. There's <laughs> so yes, they take over the world. They have a golden age. They have like the great food. They have the great women. Then they have the great uh, literature. <laughs> <laughs> no fanga Abby. Abby. No fanga. <laughs> your your accent's almost spot on, but it's just not quite. It's still uh, you still got some of that fucking IRA in you. Oh yeah, it probably does. It probably does. <laughs> no fanga Abby. I can't. <laughs> so good and then something awful happened james are you ready for this i'm ready dude the eu came and the eu came and they took away the english empire and then have, have, have a bottle in your gob you non-slag <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
classic. Uh, I have a fucking bottle in your gob. Love it. And look at look at the little kid here. <laughs> She's reaching out and there's the knife. <laughs> this hits so close to home. I, I can't tell these stories on air, but it's so close to home where I nearly die for being a southerner. And all of the people are identical to what you're putting on. That's why I'm laughing so hard because it's so true. It's unbelievable, dude. Um <laughs> That is the average northern man. I swear <laughs> to Christ. <laughs> just want to batter the cunts. Yeah, he's probably going to go around bottling them, isn't he? Oh, I hate nonsense. I just want to batter the cunts. <laughs> People, like, uh, if there are any Americans watching, you're probably like, what is going on? But again, it's important to understand that England is not this, like, um, unified uh, chunk of people who are all, like, sound like James or something like that. There's a very big blend. And this is one example. <laughs> So, <laughs> so yeah, this is an English night. Greg's nightclub. in the background as well. <laughs> Greg's. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, these are the Brits. These are our dude, great dude, Brits. dude. That is that is the Arndale Centre. I um I do go there occasionally. That is literally Manchester. Oh, I believe me. I know this is like allegedly this is what you look like as well on a on a, a Monday a Monday evening. Only um, only when I go out of Mr. Castles. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, this is um, this is English because this is high English culture. People, these are the people where allegedly we were supposed to rule. Like, it's just like, look at this. No, dude, hey. Manchester's a sick city. You you walk around the town and there are so many just diseased people walking around. Just it's just disgusting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Check this, <laughs> North FC. <laughs> so we, have, it's the Virgin Chad meme, but we have uh, the Virgin reading books, voting education sobriety intelligence employment <laughs> diets respectability then we have the north and he's like footy mate drunkenness greg's pints bennies chanting north fc <laughs> ignorance and goob do obesity <laughs> greg's so good <laughs> okay and this is this is on a uh, onto onto the actual serious topical stuff such as genealogy of morals so um we will get into that now. I'd love to ask you, James, just briefly some of your thoughts, though, on the North FC and what's going on. I didn't really follow a coherent plot line with what you were saying, to be honest. It just looked like a, <laughs> a bunch of um, uh, images just to poke fun at the English. But I will have you know that the North are far more similar to the Irish than they are to the South. Like, wait, at least, at least to the Northern Islanders. I'm not even joking. You come up here, it's exactly the same. Go down South, it's its own little world. So you were just laughing at yourself the whole way through that. Not at me, dude. <laughs> We don't like the Northerners. They sort of smell bad. They're all obese. It's, it's hideous. Uh, to, be to be honest, I'm going to have to give you that. As in, uh, I do believe that the Irish and uh, the Norths have a lot more of a, a connection than the the, the Southern Puffers, like yourself. So yeah, um, it's literally like a different world going up here. I don't feel at home up in the North. You know, all the, whenever I take the piss out of Northerners, I am joking, sort of, but it's, it's definitely not like home. It's just a very, very, very different vibe, and lots yeah, of footy. And I never understood footy. To be honest, it's just a bit, it's just a bit weird. It's a whole bunch of sweaty men playing with a ball and kicking it around. And the Greg's in the half time. It's, I'd never understood it, dude. Never understood it. I must, um, I must try. I was trying to articulate a very important plot that's going to lead us into this. So, um, the idea was, <laughs> although it was the meme, so maybe I did fail. But it was this idea that you have this people who are separate and who were the Romans came in and conquered Lower England, and then obviously they left. But then the Anglo Saxons came in, who were a separate people. And establish rulership over these Norths. But then through the integration of the English Empire, these Norths became part of the Anglo-Saxon Empire yeah. and ended up ruling the world in a very, very strange, weird way. So their identity is tied up with something that was, you could argue, was an Anglo-Saxon thing. Like they would call themselves English, but traditionally that would have been the antithesis of what their identity was. And yep. it goes to show um the complexity of of our our tribes our nations if you will there's something unbelievably um complex about it and this plays a lot into what nietzsche noticed in this book about the idea of morality and the idea of class and the idea of uh, race and tribe and all this stuff so i'm gonna gonna get put on the serious face a bit here we're actually gonna get into the book somewhat so i will rip through it but I, it, this does involve talking more about england i think i'm going on a little bit of a, a binge today on that yeah we know we know that you do have some kind of complex around england where you wish to become an englishman so this should be very interesting i don't think so i wish to con to conquer them and establish a new ruler class just like the the Norths were integrated into the Anglo-Saxon culture. 
I wish to integrate the English into the Irish Empire, let's put it that way. Um, so in order to set the stage and change the tone, I saw some guy on Twitter say, modern politics is a weak attempt to articulate what the strong in the ancient world understood innately about power. Who's some guy on Twitter? I, I think his name was, I can't remember his name. Uh, I just remember seeing it. It popped in my mind. So let's talk a little bit about how the English were made. Oh, yes, please. I love this topic. You originally had the Britons. Now, down in France, you had the Bretons. You can still see them today. Brittany is where it is. Yep. I, the Irish people had the Breton law. These were the natives. You could call them the Celts if you want, but I'm not sure even if that's a good... People don't really know how to categorize this, but these Britons, you will go around England, you see a lot of people with black hair, a lot of people with brown hair, dark eyes. These is this is probably the people who were here in some sense. Now you had a Germanic tribes come in at some point, uh, the Saxons, the Anglo Saxons, and the Jutes, where we get the name England from is from Anglia, from England. Mm -hmm. These people invaded, and they did something quite interesting. They invaded like the Vikings did, very very small chunks of warrior elites, and what they would go in is they would kill the natives and establish a ruling class. Mm -hmm. They would establish a hierarchy, so you'd have a small group of German, Germanic, um, blonde, Norse people ruling over these now native Britons. Any thoughts on this, James, first of all, for a bounce on? No, that's 100% correct. Yeah, on the Celt thing, we're really not quite sure what the Celtic part of the UK was like. It's not even the UK, then England, or the, whatever our islands are called, were like. Celts is kind of a word which you use to just generally describe the random tribes that were going around. So, yeah, but most of our identity came after the Roman Empire came in in um, about 2000 years ago Julius Caesar so you can carry on carry on with your tale Be beautiful beautiful and so this sets up a very important premise in that you have a group who usually are foreign come into this this land England and they establish a dominance over the lower people and they, they become the ruling class they become the aristocrats the elites the royalty if you will and um Later on, Normandy is a very famous one where the French came in and they invaded England. And these people were actually Norsemen who had invaded France from centuries before. And now they decided they wanted to fight their brothers, essentially, in England. And so they, they invaded England and took over and established uh, a French-speaking court in there that was still a Norse court. And the, the Normandy, the Norsemen, Normandy, this is where D-Day happened, by the way, which is interesting. And um, the Normans took over Ireland as well. And all of the castles in Ireland come from this sort of Norman Viking era when the Irish natives were into making hill forts like those Norths were. I don't know, did you see the hill fort? But then these Vikings come in and they decided, right, we're going to be a ruling class over you. And what we're going to do is establish a a kingdom with castles and whatnot so it was a, a lot different of an idea they were you could say more advanced in some sense they dublin for example is a used to be a slave city it's a viking city limerick is another one uh, waterford wexford these are all viking cities stone based different to the natives and they were the ruling class and they were networked all around with all these germanic tribes that were doing this and this is what formed you could say the the elites of the old days these all these people that we would consider separate nations now were actually ruled by probably a very very tight hereditary family in some sense um a very very, very small tribe so uh yep any any yeah that's all good that's yep that's 100 percent correct all right and so what's interesting about that is when we try to imagine nationalism nowadays we say something like the english and as i said the norths who would have been the britons originally and this is why James is saying, for example, the Britons are very similar to the Irish. They are. They probably would have been the same people. But then if you even look at the genetic maps, you'll see over here on the the, the, the right side of England, there's a lot more of this haplogroup called Or1A, which is the blonde haplogroup from East Europe. That's There's way more of that over in London and where these Anglo-Saxons would have established themselves compared to the rest of it. And so this is why in England you do have like a lot of blondes, like James, for example, but then you have plenty of brown-haired people or dark-haired people. Did you so you say uh, R1A was the blonde one? Yes. Okay, because I'm R1B, and I'm, oh. I'm, te I'm, te I'm technically a blonde boy. But, um, oh. is, but, is your but, dad? But my, my, uh, my, my dad, he's got um, brown hair, very, very, very dark brown hair. Ah, well. And then he, he's the Irish connection. The Y chromosome haplogroup group it originates over in Ireland, though. Um, That's interesting, because the... Um, if your dad has uh, dark hair, he's probably he's probably the R1B. But then, is is your mum got the the blonde hair, blue eyes? Yeah, basically, yeah. And she's from London, is she? 
Yeah, it's um, I traced my family history back quite far. There's there's a bit of Northerner in there, but it's mostly London. Yeah. Oh, there's a bit of North, North. A Slipman. tiny bit. Well, it's up up in Yorkshire, which I don't don't like Yorkshire very much because it will just sound kind of funny. But yeah, no, it's mostly Londoner. Oh, that's interesting. So I think your your male half of the group anyway was uh, seems like it was it was that. But you, you get what I'm saying, nonetheless. Like it's that general general pattern and whatnot. And yeah. this becomes very important because we in the modern world can consider ourselves as like the, these unified blocks that we should all have the same values. But back in the day when this was going on, the Britons wouldn't have liked the Anglo-Saxons. Like the people who lived in quote unquote Britain wouldn't have liked the English because the English would have come in and said, we are the rulers and you serve us, you're our slaves. That's mm -hmm. the dynamic that would have went on. And the morality there is a lot different then because the morality there is that we are better than you and we are good and great and you are lower and crap and shit. We don't like you. And the same ways, you can even see the reflections in that in the Norths nowadays where it's like, oh, fucking stuff and puffed us. And that's sort of a remnant of that energy of like these, these invaders, these foreigners, these people who are not us. It's still there, you know? Nor Northerners are um, way, way more masculine. And way more extroverted than southerners are i don't i've got no hard data on that but from experience if you were to get a southerner and a northern northerner in the same room the northerner would kill the southerner nine times <laughs> out of ten no competition at all and um that's interesting because i wonder is it be because of an extended period of civilizing which is these, and this is yes. another interest, interesting thing, is these castle-building Vikings, these castle-building Norse people, they were more, shall we say, civilized. And what eventually happens is over an extended period of time, that's, that civilizing power turns on them. And we'll get into why, um, what happens there. Um, but it turns on them and it, it kind of cooks them in some sense. And you see this all over Europe right now. Like, you know, where is the most cooked nations in the world? And you would say Germany, uh, UK, and Scandinavia, and it's 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 almost like they at one point were the most wealthy and civilized nations with the highest IQs and everything. So it's it's something very interesting about that that they 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 were the people who conquered, and now the Norths can come down and be like, you fucking fucking cunt, you soft. And then yeah, it yeah. proved it true. Yeah, hundred percent. So yes, yeah, so in order to further drive this home, I'm speaking of how the little British Empire here and the 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 Royal Irish. British Empire that was going on that was not the English quote unquote or you know this this united nationalist England that we see nowadays conquering Ireland per se it was more that the ruling class would have decided that Ireland is to be integrated into the the British crown and the Normans for example the Norman kings this 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 family that took over most of Europe was decided this is what we're going to do geopolitically geopolitically with Ireland like still over in England the Britons were getting enslaved by the same royal family and the irish are getting enslaved by the same royal family it's a small group of people who originally came from the continent and um, even the norths like it was quite famous if you watch a, a film like billy elliot where they have um their their dad and the dad is a miner and so this this miner even as late as the industrial age this northern miner was just living essentially like a slave crawling and destroying his body and his, his health and everything for the sake of uh the the, the, the empire and whatnot and and, and it, it kind of all worked this way. This globally in in Europe, there was a there was a ruling intellectual, ruling sorry royal class, the monarchs, and they were all of the same bloodline, which is super interesting. Like yeah. the, it was it was very Germanic, and um, yeah, like I think during World War One, this man here, Wilhelm, was the king of Germany, and he was the eldest grandchild of Queen Victoria, the Queen yep. of England. And his first cousin was the king, King George of England, and uh, yeah, it was just absolutely insane. Uh, this, this, m these monarchs ruled all of Europe. They're all interrelated in some sense. A similar bloodline. It's Tsar Nicholas II as well, I think. Who's who? If you put him next to Kaiser Wilhelm, you can't really tell the two apart. They look completely yeah. identical. They, yeah, you're right. It's all the same bloodline, which is very strange. I think this is where the conspiracy theories come from. I think there's yeah. another explanation for that, certainly, which is just. Well, that's what Nietzsche would say that the strong survive. Yeah, the, these people would have been the, the 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 ruling classes of the past. Now, maybe there is something to do with the bloodlines, but it's interesting because nationalism changed all that stuff. Here, here's another example, um, just how far this stuff goes. This is the Habsburgs. So this is one family. These people had the Holy Roman Empire. This is all of Germany, and then the other side of the family had all of Spain. Spain was a superpower at one point like huge this is when they were taking over all of uh, all of america and whatnot 
Mm. And um, yeah, they, they had a huge family dispersion. This is like half of the important parts of Europe. And the, these were both Habsburgs families. And then there was the same up there with the Brits. Fucking, fucking Brits. Mm. And so um, the idea here that Nietzsche is sort of getting at is that perhaps these Germanic people were more vital than the natives that they ended up conquering. And this is why they established the monarchies of um, Europe, because they were outside the pale of the Roman Empire. They were outside that pale, that civilizing force of the Roman Empire. And so they were more in touch with their, their natural energy. Now, there, there is also the explanation that they were just simply a, a, a sort of ruling race of some sort. Like that they were just always destined to be that way. But it's also possible that they just had more vitality because they lived among the forests while most other people were getting subjugated by the Romans and 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 whipped into shape or some sort. And and this um when they began to tame this energy and and direct it towards conquering these, you know, everybody in England and Ireland were now Christian and they were, you know, in these monasteries and they were, you know, being very good, obeying what Nietzsche would call a slave morality killing off their vitality, being ashamed of their instincts, somewhat um, focusing on the book and all that, becoming very cultured and whatnot. And then these people were meanwhile running around the forest chasing pigs, and they were more in touch with their energy. They were healthy, they were vibrant, and the healthy instincts of such men would decide, all right, I want to go conquer stuff. I want to get more of these these beautiful women here. So they'd, they'd look over across the sea and be like, like in the, the film The Vikings or the TV series The Vikings, I'm going to go over and I'm going to take England. And they do it to Ireland as well. And so these people started attacking these, shall we say, cooked parts of Europe and started to establish their domination over them, creating the modern monarchies that we see now. Mm -hmm. um, any, any spins on that, James? No, no, I think you're doing a good job so far. When you make an inevitable blunder, I will come in and create you and laugh at you. Don't worry. Beautiful, beautiful. So this is quite interesting because this describes the dynamic of power that we somewhat don't understand very well in this world, that... At the top, there is almost always a very, very small amount of people, sometimes even only one, like a king. And these people can rule a unbelievably large amount of people. It's so hard for us to get our heads around this because through the hierarchy of command, we can orchestrate massive projects with very, very small people making decisions. And it's essential. This is a natural um, system that, that arises. Hierarchies always appear. They, like, and this is what I'm sort of pointing out here is that even in a democracy, you still have a hierarchy. You still have a president. You still have um, government officials. You might even have money behind the throne. You don't even know what's going on. I guess that's one of the sinister sides of democracy is that you don't really understand what's going on. You, you sort of see the front man, which is the president, but you don't know what who's really up there doing what. And so um, these hierarchies are always there. And all these... All these ruling classes had to do, all these Germans, like if you think about our Germans, like these Norse, all they had to do at one point was say to themselves, all we need to do is go in and kill the king, and then we can subjugate the entire people. We can, we can take, we can aspire, we can ambition to become the great people who take over. And all they'd have to do is slip in and take these top positions, kill the soldiers, take these top positions, then the scribes, the merchants, the artisans, the farmers, the slaves, all of that falls under the, under underneath your, your yoke. And so these up here could be a foreign power because it's so small. You could get a small group of warriors who would come in and they could rule the Britons. You could get the Anglo-Saxons coming in and rule the Britons. You could get the English coming in and rule the Irish. That's This is how these dynamics work. And it's not an uncommon thing to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, the way these people would think, this vital way of thinking would be a lot different than the people who were enslaved. The people who were enslaved would have resentment, anger towards these rulers. They would see them as the foreigners, like the Norse would see the sovereign puffs. And mm -hmm. so they'd be, they'd be against them. They'd be like, why are these people dominating us? This is horrible. This is evil. We don't like them. They're, they're cruel. They're, they're rotten. But the fact is that they don't have any power, so their reality never gets pushed forward. They get whipped. They, they're simply tools of the state that the ruling class uses and forces them to obey. And uh, sometimes you get revolts when the slaves would get sick of this shit and take them out. But <clears throat> before we get into all that stuff and discuss, so basically what we're, we're painting out there is that there's a difference between the way these two people think. Before we get into that, we have to get into the philosophy of vitalism. And um, this is something very important to Nietzsche. James, how much have you caught in terms of the will to power and all that stuff? Like, well, what do you make it at? I think the will to power is a very, very interesting idea. He, um, 
Because he it's not actually a hundred percent clear what he means by will to power either, especially not in the translations, because it's 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 will du macht, something like that in German, which is the will to create or the will to make, but we translate it as will to power, and he used it in many, many, many different contexts. But so he uses it as um, as an excuse, semi-excuse to throw away previous philosophy, which is perhaps correct, where he just considers that all philosophy has been in the past is individual will to powers being their own autobiographical essence fighting with each other across the centuries. And he's like, that's all nonsense. Then the will to power is also the individual's innate drive to go and become an excellent individual at the same time. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a fluffy term that you can't, you can't lock it down. I don't think so anyway. Yes. It's interesting. Yeah, it, it is. And it, it, it's quite strange that, um, Heraclitus, uh, like Nietzsche read a lot of Heraclitus. Heraclitus had this conception that everything is fire, that the 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 universe is made of fire, and all that we are is this personification of this fire. Now we'd use the term energy in the modern world, so that's a very interesting way to think about this. Because I, I'm assuming Nietzsche draw drew this out of it that everything changes, and the, the 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 driving force of change is this energy idea, and we are embodiments of that in some sense and so if we the more energy we have is the more power we have in some sense the more life we have inside of us whatever whatever there's something strange about our, our physiology meaning that like whatever way we're orchestrated orientated it's almost like an expression of our energy of our consciousness in some sense Nietzsche's somewhat describing consciousness as a reflection of how much of this energy you've internalized into yourself so this this idea is quite interesting because it, it almost implies that the the bigger the stronger the more deftly created people are of a higher consciousness than the people who lack this energy lack this vitality in some sense and it's almost like consciousness is claimed away from life in some sense it's made out of energy and this would be a a philosophy of vitalism that's based off um, nature. It's very, it's very much to do with uh, physicality and um, the energy that comes from that. The energy of the the passions, the energy of expression, the energy of of uh, of of uh, as I'm saying, vibrancy, vitality, the the kind of shining power that it is to be someone. And and the goal is always to um, get more of this vitality because it's almost like this energy is the thing that will guide you the way you can think about it is like Sverring is a good example. Like if you eat an animal in some sense, you're taking its energy that's embodied inside that being. And then you're putting it into yourself and that's going to fuel you to go do something more noble and higher. Whereas if you um, eat plants that they're not as vital as animals are, and therefore your energy would wane in some sense. And so it's very important that you orientate yourself towards behaviors that increase your vitality. Yes, I'm just trying to think of a maths formula actually on how to lay out what will to power might mean. It's something like um, your potential energy in relation to the actual energy that you release. So you need to have a huge reservoir of vitality and energy, but you also need to direct it in a particular place. And that's where his whole self overcoming things come, comes from. Yes, so it's, absolutely. A, it's not simply you are a you're an athlete we'll say and you have more potential energy than somebody else that would be more will to power you've got to take that and you've got to turn yourself almost like internal alchemy into something powerful that's willing to praise the gods with your work so yeah, yeah. it was it was it was very very similar to going back and becoming homer essentially going and living in that part of greece which he admired very very much because that's what they were all into it was like inspire me the muse and i will create this for the purpose of praising you even though he's an atheist in many ways so it is it's a very inspiring philosophy i'll put it like that and it's something you it's very difficult to disagree with because who would want less vitality but the yes. the, the the clincher here is that he's placing that potential to unleash vitality onto the world as the ultimate form of good and that's yes where, that's that's where the fun stuff can can start being dug into and that's that's the that's a great observation and yeah that was really well put like that that is fundamentally what he starts doing is that these people who took over were more vital they had they were more in touch with that vitality was it something innate to them were they born that way was it something to do with their race or was it something to do with the fact that they were beyond the yoke of this civilizing force of christianity and um, that like that's a big question that's a huge question mm. regardless um 
this the idea is that they had this and this led them to become the ruling class and now what's happening and this is his his worry is that the, they are losing this they have lost this and so they have essentially fell from grace all the monarchies are over now and so that's a terrible thing because that means the best people the leaders are, are have lost their vitality and that, that puts us in a deft place because that means we're we're ru ruled by the democracy of of northmen and irishmen which is uh, i don't know do, do the angles want that anymore so uh, yeah i think the north of england is more uh, more right wing than the south of england which is a very interesting thing to observe like brexit was heavily influenced by the north for example yeah which yeah. is something something to observe which is something i would actually go ahead and, and agree with which is upsetting because i don't want to agree with the north on anything well this is what i sort of meant by this idea of the national national boundaries are so interesting because the norths would fight against brexit the southerners would be way more for brexit which is or we're for european union which is interesting whereas the norths would fight against uh the european union because they would have this um identity tied up to the idea of the british empire even though the british empire is in some sense something more anglo-saxon than anything even of course like the north took part in it but you get what i'm saying it, it mm. was uh that was traditionally that that was the queen of the south was traditionally the people who enslaved them yeah and now they, they are now currently they are fighting for that identity that is sort of faded into the past which is so nuts when you think about it yeah there's there's a massive massive cultural shadow projection against people with the rp accent which is i've got a very soft rp accent but take um who's the dude the jolly heretic dude Dutton. he's got a very 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 heavy rp accent and lots of we'll say common folk Average people, they will project heavily against individuals like that and go, they're bad, they're 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 just um, they're rich poshos who are repressing us, even if they're not oppressed. So that's definitely locked the back inside them. And yeah, you're probably right. I think it goes back to the British Empire. So that would be an example of that of that slave idea. You know, we haven't covered it properly yet, but that slave resentment, that that resentment against people who perhaps once ruled over them. And then who knows what that's going to do? It means that's going to unleash itself on the world stage. We don't know. But the signs in terms of shadow are definitely there. Oh God. The uh, the Norths are going to team up with the Irish and invade England, will we? Will we? I've 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 gotten into serious trouble because of my accent, and I can joke about this, I can laugh about this, but it's serious, and I'm not going to say anything in case there are people outside my window there listening in who are willing to drag me outside as soon as I'm done. I am, um, yeah. I I think I think you should be shaking in your boots, James. To be honest, we're we're organizing over here, getting ready. And um, so in the in the preface of genealogy and morals, Nietzsche talks about the fact that a lot of what we do is unconscious. And this is where he dropped something young in long before young was even you know a, a, a sparkle in his dad's eye and so he talks about how that we do things so much without knowing why we do things we are consciousness of our moral behaviors are unbelievably murky and unclear like why do we think altruism is good you'll start getting into this why do we why would we why would did we build the pyramids they like did we consciously know why we were doing that perhaps maybe it was aliens who knows but could have there been a factor where these people could have been creating a structure that symbolically that represented the symbolic representation of the dominance hierarchy that we were looking at back here like were they in fact making that but it was they just had a religious feel like some pharaoh just got this religious feeling around this idea and said right we're going to build one of these motherfuckers and that's what led to that like was it some type of unconscious creation going on we we don't know this stuff and so nietzsche said it's our duty quote unquote as philosophers and this is where he shows you that uh he shows you the unbelievable sophistication of his philosophical technique i don't really see this in other philosophers it shows me that he he really is good at what he does he says our job is to actually question this to in order to think we must think about what we're not thinking about and we're not thinking about morality we assume these they are unconsciously guiding us and how do we check if these morals are true and so this becomes a very big problem he asks himself how has morality changed over time over period over history over class over caste and when he looked through history in order to do this book he became very astounded about what he found. Yeah, so it, just um, an example that might bring us to light. Imagine if there's somebody on the street who's who's hurt, we'll say they've just been hit by a car perhaps, and you go over and you help them and you manage to get them better again by calling an ambulance. 
most people would presume that they're doing it because that makes them a good person. But Nietzsche is saying, why don't you think for a moment? And he's, he's really, really heavy on this. He's like, make sure that you think and take things apart properly, including reading me. He almost predicted that everyone in the future would read him wrong. He says this so many times throughout his work. He's like, stop being a twat and read me properly. So in that example, it's are you doing it to be a good person or are you doing it because it makes you look like a good person Ooh. which makes you show up to the group as a good person which gets you social capital in an intangible manner of course so that's an example where what you're doing and even to yourself what you think you're doing is not what you're actually doing so there's a there's a, a distance wow. process there so over a long period of time what he then says is he takes an example like that and he expands it out over 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 10,000 years, and goes, maybe you can extrapolate across time as if what you're doing now is rooted 10,000 years ago. And so that's so far apart that we have no idea what we're actually just presume things. And even the philosophers whose job it is to figure out what we're doing, they haven't done it. They all have their own personal biases. So it's my job as Frederick Nietzsche to actually figure out what's going on. So and I think he does a good job of this. Yes, yes, he does. And that's a really good point is that you you would do a behavior, quote unquote, that you consider good. And you would think you're doing it because, quote unquote, you consider it good, when in fact, you might be doing it for social validation. And what's interesting is that that's that mechanism of social validation is the thing that keeps these things alive they may be unconscious they may even be incorrect as Nietzsche will discuss now but because they are socially considered good they're they're reinforced and therefore they become habit and that's a fascinating idea because that means that we are all sort of unconsciously participating in this brainwashing and um, this brainwashing behavior that is uh ruining us in some sense it's like a bad habit if you will and, yep. and Nietzsche, Nietzsche is trying to inspect that and so one example of this is, well, I guess he, he sort of pays tribute to a hero here. He loves Schopenhauer. It was the first philosopher he had. Schopenhauer was a pessimist, and he considered uh, some very, very bad things about life. If you ever watch True Detective with Matthew McConaughey, he, he often quotes Schopenhauer. And the idea that Nietzsche notes with Schopenhauer is that suffering is a bad thing. You know, Schopenhauer concludes that suffering is bad. That's a moral conclusion. So he, he looks at suffering in the world and says, that can't be good. And he makes that leap. And um, Nietzsche draws this parallel to the idea of Buddhism and Christianity. And he also draws this parallel to the idea of where the European soul is currently at. The, the Europeans during his day are, are, are super rich, super civilized. The Anglo-Saxons, the Germanic tribes have, have conquered and become the ruling class over like all of Europe. And now they're in this point where they're, they're sort of so civilized that they're starting to get a bit soft. They're turning into southern puftas, right? All of them. So Nietzsche is sort of a north, if you think about it. Whereas, uh, how dare you? Don't ever say that again. <laughs> whereas the whereas the rest of them, the the soft people like Schopenhauer, are sort of like James, the the southern puftas. And so what's happening is, uh, puftas. I, I got to learn to say that better. What's happening is they they're over civilized and they're starting to become weak. They're starting to turn on their vitality because the vitality of life actually drives you towards suffering. The, the Norseman who says, I want to invade England is actually risking, is actually saying to himself, I'm going to hurt a lot of people and I'm probably going to die and it's going to hurt a lot. And like, there's just suffering is, is going to increase when you seek for that vitality. It might be better for him to just go and become a humble farmer and kill and cull off his ambition. But his vitality is dragging him towards that great adventure. And the only thing usually in the way is the suffering. And so as these people decide, okay, this suffering is bad. They are doing something interesting where they are castrating this libido, this vital energy, mm -hmm. which is the, the, the worst thing you can do in Nietzsche's mind, because what that does is that kills off your ability to express that power. As we said at the start, the innate power that teaches you what to do, that's built inside of you. And then you start to look to things that castrate that libido as good. And Nietzsche would say things like self-sacrifice and whatnot. Yes. Um, th this is this is the quote here. James, you want to read the quote or should we just keep bouncing on? I can read the quote. I do it in a, oh no, it's not Nietzsche's thing, is it? I was going to do it in a nice, Jawohl, German accent. <laughs> Actually, just then I was preoccupied with something much more important than the nature of hypotheses, mine or anybody else's on the origin of morality, or to be more exact, the latter concerned me only for one end, to which it is one of many means. For me, it was a question of the value of morality. And here I had to confront my great teacher, Arthur Schopenhauer, 
to whom that book of mine spoke as though he was still on the genealogy of morality, 616, completely, utterly. Oh, hang on, wait. What? Why have you got numbers there? Why is it yeah, on the genealogy model 616? What the hell does that even mean? I, I, I don't know. Skip that. All the... Oh, fuck. No, shit. I've got the quote wrong. Bollocks. <laughs> For God's sake. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to recover this by talking about something else that uh, Mr. Schopenhauer thought. So Mr. Schopenhauer, he liked the idea of self-sacrifice. And, and it, a lot of us being entrenched in um, Christian metaphysics, or at least the presuppositions of it, we think that self-sacrifice is a good thing. Now, it's, of course, observed in most mammals that mothers will sacrifice themselves for their children. But say sacrificing yourself for a friend or for a small child or anything, would you take a bullet for someone? You know, it's that test of friendship you normally do when you're 14. Oh, you, you, would you take a bullet for me? It's what girls always test you with constantly, your very first girlfriend. And you go, of course I would, of course I would, of course I would. But without actually knowing the reason behind why self-sacrifice is a good thing, in other words, under which circumstances it would be a good thing. What you're doing is you're killing yourself without knowing the reason why. And that is the essence of nihilism. So what Nietzsche valued was something that served life. And he did not value was something that served death. So it's almost mm -hmm. like you could, this is a simplification, but you can, you can tentatively replace good and evil in his model with serving life and serving death. And yes. So if you are self-sacrificing yourself without knowing the reason, if you're going ahead and following Christian morality without having first read on the genealogy of morals or at least attempted to take a part, you're not only bending the knee to something you don't understand, but what you're doing is you're ending your own life to serve the God of death, which is nihilism. And that's no good. And what, he, what, he, what I wanted to articulate in this quote that I fucked up and uh, made James <laughs> take the fall as well, which is brilliant. Uh, another instance of the Southern Pofters getting slighted by the Norths is um he, he is sure. trying to just he is trying to describe the idea of um egotism as the way egotism is a representation of you know do you, you ever think of the the, the quote-unquote the chad the alpha male and he's usually just arrogant and in his reality and boastful hmm. and um there's something very vital and lifelike about that people can hate him for that in some sense and what you'll start doing is like if you know if you're a bit resentful you'll start saying to all the people it's like oh that guy he's so arrogant he's so up himself He's so selfish and like he should be a bit more, you know, he should be a bit more um, unegotistic. He should be a bit more, he should, he should, when he gets that instinct to talk and even though it makes everybody laugh, he should, he should grab that instinct and, and push it down on himself and say, no, shut up. Let the other people talk in some sense. Mm. And so this, this desire to, to, to grab th these, these Chad's people instincts and, and bully them out of existence is, is a, a a little spark that you'll see can grow in a super civilized society into raising that behavior to like the absolute idea of moral, moral good. Because if you believe that any expression of that instinct in that alpha male is good, you start to, or sorry, any expression of that instinct in that alpha male is, is negative, is bad, it causes suffering. Then you start to see everything that stops that as, as the savior to the world. And this is what Schopenhauer started to say. So like instincts like self-denial and um, rejecting your passions, uh, you know, suppressing your emotions and all this, suppressing your desire, culling your ambition, all these things become good. And this is where Nietzsche starts to poke a lot of fun at Christianity saying, you know, um, pride being a sin, that's fucking interesting. Because like, is pride necessarily a bad thing? Like, is, don't you need pride in order to reach for the heights, for the heavens? Don't you need pride in order to seek things? Um, charity in the sense that you give to others more than you deserve yourself. Like, that's an interesting one. I, I'm Personally, I don't even think that's a bad, like, I don't think that's a, a vice to, to be charitable. But it's interesting when that pathologizes and becomes this point where you absolutely become so altruistic that you always bend to knee to everybody else in some sense. You always cull your own emotions and your own reality and your own desire for the sake of other people. And that becomes very, very strange when it's played out. And Nietzsche noticed that um, European culture has has developed this to a point that he's he says, are we going to move towards a new Buddhism, a new Euro-Buddhism? So he blames Christianity and Buddhism for the, this, this thinking um, to nihilism. And that's so fascinating that he called that, considering that the, probably the biggest religion that tried to replace Christianity was this sort of Buddhism that showed up. You know, everybody does meditation and yoga now and all this, and everybody talks about tolerance and everybody talks yeah. about being unegotistical. That's profound that Nietzsche spotted this coming out. Like it's another evidence that he's, he really does know what he's talking about in that the modern 
people of today think that it's good to be unegotistical to a religious extent. They have no religious architecture for this, but they use a sort of philosophical Buddhism of some sort to do it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that, James. Can't believe I fucking threw you under the bus. I so forgive bad. you. The Irish have an extraordinarily low IQ on average. So <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's it's my fault for choosing to do a stream with you. Look, look, man. You keep saying shit like that, and us, us in the Norths, man. Us in the Chad Norths. Like we will, we will show you who's boss. We will come into you, puffers. It's, so it's, yeah, it's just cute from my perspective. Just. Cute. <laughs> All right. So um. So yeah, so setting seeds here for the future, future world revolution, and so this is the idea of compassion and the idea of 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 these type of uh, these type of virtues that we consider innate. Pity, compassion, we think they're so great. What heals someone more? Do you think? Do you think it's the great cathedral that they go in to pray, and then they're in the presence of something that's profoundly divine, where they see all these wonderful images of Christ, or do you think it's the the, the niceness of the priest? who stands in that cathedral. Like, do you think when you have a problem, say the most profound problem where you think life is pointless or something like that, and you go in and the priest says, oh, I understand you. Like, there is obviously virtue to that. There's value to that. And it does help people to some extent. But isn't there a part of you that also understands that sometimes when you're stuck in that place where you just don't really know what to do and you go into the cathedral and it shows you the grandeur of what a hum human can achieve. It shows you that what, what vitality can make. Doesn't that show you in some sense, oh shit, there's more to this. Like, doesn't Notre Dame, th th didn't it demonstrate to you that there's something almost transcendental about humanity? And you can find that in the, the greatness of its works in some sense. And mm. so maybe pedestalizing pity and compassion is... It's a strange one to put up there at the expense of this idea of the vitality required to create, create something like a great cathedral. So, um, that becomes an interest problem then is if we pedestalize that, that compassion, does it castrate vitality, as we're saying? Mm -hmm. And so an interesting way to think about Nietzsche is that he, he's looking at morality in terms of an artist, the way an artist would look at morality. So we dogmatize morality. We say, well, you must be compassionate because that's the right thing to do just implicit whereas Nietzsche would say right let's look at the end goal what are we trying to achieve do we want it to live in a society full of those beautiful cathedrals we want to live in a society full of those Greek statues we want to live in a great society that is fully expressing its vitality and therefore morality is simply a tool that we must use to get to that end so what we use morality for is we decide okay Will this bring us one step closer to vitality and the manifestation of that vitality via controlling our will, like the will to power style? Or will we, or will it bring us a step away? And that's the only criteria. Is it the right move, like in chess, or is it the wrong move? It's not about dogmatism. Is it correct or not correct? It's about will it bring us closer to this? That's the, that's the thing he's, he's worried about. He's worried that if especially because we'll become anti-christian what will happen is we will dogmatize stuff like the european buddhism that he was talking about the nihilism we'll say christian virtues are castrated from christianity and then become dogma and we don't even question where they're bringing us we just say you cannot violate these things you cannot you cannot speak against tolerance you cannot speak against some very interesting values that are floating out nowadays dogmatic which are dogmatized as opposed to the idea of well what future is it going to create and that becomes scary because does that mean we're sacrificing the splendor of the future for the sake of dogmatism for the sake of whatever the fuck motivates us to hold these virtues of compassion and and pity and um, european buddhism if you want to call it does that mean that we're because we won't give up those we're going to fall towards this ugly future and how can we call that a moral good? Shouldn't shouldn't we, in this position where we're held, we're holding the burden of nihilism in our hands, decide that okay, if we're going to move forward, what we've got to do is reframe what we're aiming for and reframe our morality to suit that, to shoot for future splendor. Any thoughts, James? Because that's a big idea. Yeah, my thoughts would be trying to critique that hard but take a look at where we are in the modern world 
it's clear that Nietzsche was right, at least in terms of prediction. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that his model is right. It doesn't necessarily mean there is master and herd morality, etc. But it lends great credence to what happens when you devalue some form of excellence is we end up in a sort of hellhole. I mean, that's what happened in, in um, Soviet Russia, for example. And he broke down precisely why he thought that a e equality doctrine would lead to something so horrendous. So it leaves you in a, in a situation where, OK, Nietzsche said all these things. He seems correct when you read him. And then now we have the benefits or even the horror of living you know, 150 years after he wrote these words and we can see what's taken place on the world stage. You then have to go back and think to yourself, this is actually terrifying. Maybe Nietzsche had everything right. No. And, the, and, the, and the consequences of that are huge, absolutely enormous. And so perhaps we can try over the course of this little series to get to the bottom of that, because I, for one, don't necessarily want Nietzsche's words to be correct because of their huge, because of the magnitude of what they would do to us and our past and everything that we've deemed to be true so far. But it looks like you cannot throw him away. I mean, look at the world around you right now. We're in a serious mess. There is no, even the fact, even toxic masculinity, for example, is yeah. like any, because toxic masculinity is saying any striving for excellence is toxic and we have to tone that back, which is exactly beat for beat what Nietzsche wrote slave morality was, beat for beat. And, and you can tie it up. I think, um, I think Peterson got some of his ideas from this idea when he talks all about resentment and how all the social justice warriors, they're just resentful against other people for being successful. He lifted that word for word. He did not come up with that. He lifted that from Nietzsche's resentment, resentment idea. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 absolutely profound. Like, and, and the thing, um, the thing, yeah, like the thing that you were saying worries you is is having to dispense with what we could call these Christian virtues in some sense. Like, do you? Well, what are your thoughts on that? You know, and no need to go too deep into it, but like, generally, like you would have anxiety around that, and I understand why because that is that's like saying that your ancestors were stupid for two thousand years; they were brainwashed for two thousand years, and Nietzsche sort of pushes that forward. So, like, how does that unroot you? Yeah. So, if you look at Zarathustra in particular, but usually his writings, it seems to be that he was hitting very, very, very hard on the shadow idea. And of course, if anyone's gone through any kind of shadow integration process, it's painful. It looks to be that that's actually a marker of you integrating it properly, is that you yeah, feel yeah. a dose of pain. You know, one, one, whatever a graph would be, you get one unit of pain per X amount of shadow integrated. So, <laughs> so to consider each as being correct would mean the entire specter of the cultural shadow would have to be integrated into the individual to accept him as correct. So one, that's painful. So that's why I don't want it to be correct necessarily. But the way, having gone through this for, for quite a few years now, the the frame I've fallen into is it's either Christ who sits on the throne or it's Nietzsche who sits on the throne. It's not Kant who sits on the throne. It's not Swedenborg. You know, it's not anyone else. It's going to be Nietzsche or it's going to be Christ. And the, the proxy for Christ in my mind is Jung. So those two, I mean, you know, we've covered Ion so far and it's like Jung's got a based frame, but there's always Nietzsche in the shadows going, what if you're wrong? You know? yeah. So it's bringing that up and watching them fight. And I know either way, there's going to be a severe amount of intellectual pain, which I think only more artistically creative type individuals can appreciate. You know, the more open you are, maybe you can understand that ideas will have weight. You're more permeable to the to the feeling factor of ideas. So that's something that I'm not looking forward to if Nietzsche is correct, if that sort of answers your question. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to describe here is I think this is fundamentally Nietzsche's frame when it strikes me, when I think about it in its simplest terms to try to communicate it to people, he is talking about it as morality is a tool for getting a result, which is um, to create something at the end, like it, an end goal for a future. And that does juxtapose very heavily against Christ in some sense, because Christ yeah. is almost saying, you must act moral and that will manifest the great future. But then the, the conception of the Christian future is the apocalyptic future, where if you act moral now, you will get rewarded with this alternate universe or eventually the end of time universe or something like that. And that's interesting because that's that's a little that's that's scary, because on one hand, if it's true, that's what you should do. And if you don't do that, you're going to hell. That's the fucking horrible idea. Mm. And so you almost have to take that on faith. Now, if it's false, that leaves you in a, a frightening position where everybody else will be playing the chess game, 
Meanwhile, you'll be trying to act moral. And what will happen is you will get steamrolled by all these other people and lose. And it will turn out that you're wrong as well. And it will be for nothing. It will be the fact that you just do behaviors that are, are, are literally stupid in some sense. And that's um that's a scary idea. And I don't know how to cross those either myself. Like I'm still trying to figure that stuff out because I find it strange that Christianity was so successful for the Europeans for so long. And at the same, at the still time, it could have these behaviors in, ingrained in it. And then obviously, obviously it wasn't like perfect either. It had some mistakes in some sense. So it is a very, very hard thing to cross. And it's interesting to clash Nietzsche's frame up against it, where it's like we must look at ourselves as creators trying to create a future and allow the 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 morality to follow the evidence, follow the 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 question, like what do we want to achieve? And morality simply is relative to what we want to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. And this is presuming that you can go ahead and craft your own morality, which is itself, it's rests on a presumption that you can go ahead and do that. So, and this this is where it becomes intellectually very difficult because in order to tackle these things properly, of course, you have Jung's frame, which is you can't. And no one has since then stepped up after Jung and gone, yeah, well, Jung's wrong or Jung's right. No one, no one's done that. So it is literally left to us, like you, myself, Stefan, and everyone who's watching this to actually make up our minds about which is correct. So, and that's also very intellectually draining. And so there are lots of it's it's not a trivial matter to go through something like this and just read it and go isn't that lovely he wanted you know he, he had a nice quote about giving birth to a dancing star it's like no no either the world as you see it is this or it's this now you have to choose and when you choose one everything else burns off so, but, you, crack, you can crack on dude um and so this is something that i was trying to run because I, i'm trying to make this stuff practical because this book like you can read it yourself he explains all this stuff in a very heady way it's um fantastic read it's a really good book but i'm trying to bring this stuff out of that astral sphere and, and think about it in a tactile way and i was wondering what he meant by this idea of aiming for a future and i, I was thinking about just in simply in terms of like something like the boy i was like if we were to talk about <laughs> something that does not exist right now that we could manifest is um is there any movements because you're you're saying that very interesting thing how do we create values and that that's mm. an interesting i find that an interesting critique young said because i don't think that's what nietzsche said in in a weird way he said we must nietzsche said we must uh reevaluate all values i'm not actually sure he's necessarily saying create them anymore i, I find this interesting he's saying that we should have a goal and therefore allow our morality to reshape itself towards achieving that goal. So currently our goal is, you could say it's the Christian goal where we believe that there will be an apocalypse at the end. And our morality is therefore orientated towards doing the right thing now so that when that apocalypse happens, we won't get punished by God. So that's a very, very coherent and, and beautiful and powerful worldview. But say if we were to change that goal at the end and say our goal is to create the Roman Empire 2.0 that takes over all of space, you know, takes over all of the solar system or something like that. And it becomes this like transplanetary solar system. And that everything we do must be orientated towards reaching that. And um, that changes our morality then where it's like, well, people like Elon Musk have to get like, we have to work towards stuff like that. And it, it changes how we, how we, how we build everything and how we, how we, how we like dissipate value, dissipate money, dissipate everything. Everything changes from that, that point. And so um, I was wondering, like, is there any movements that speak this way? And I realized that in, in the weirdest way possible, that's there isn't. And this is why I think Nietzsche would have been against something like, because um, he often talks against nationalism and people that grates on people a lot. They're like, what? Um, like Nietzsche, what? And he he, he does, he, he punches at everything because he's trying to get people to think bigger, I believe. And if you think about it, is there any movement out there that's like, we want to achieve maximum splendor? That is our only ideology. We want to make a golden age. We want to see a renaissance happen. Like, do you, do you hear anybody talking about that? Now, you hear the progressives talking about, for example, a utopia. But the way they describe the utopia is it will look like this and it will have all these rules. It will be Marx's utopia and all this stuff. But you don't see people necessarily speaking from terms of an artist of some sort being like, we will create something like the Greek high culture and all this. And we're, we're working towards that. And I, I'm not sure if I see anybody on earth or in politics doing that. And how would your morality change if that happened? How would you reframe everything? How would you reimagine what you're, how you're behaving in order to achieve this goal? And I think that's a very simple and based ideal that Nietzsche is putting forward is that 
it's about what you're aiming at that determines how you act, not and not about reinventing morals for the sake of you freeing yourself. Like this is yeah. an interesting one. If people th read Nietzsche and think, "Oh, sweet, so uh, morals are relative. I can just go and uh, you know." buy bath water off some chick on the internet or something it's like that so and funny when you see people do that where where like nietzsche spent his whole life trying to combat nihilism and he was such a cheerful man he really he wanted to like laugh in the face of all the danger and then you have little kids going yeah but nietzsche said i could do whatever i want it's like, yeah you yeah. haven't read nietzsche you absolute idiot <laughs> did you think he was a southern puffer by any chance puffed up it, no, no, he would have been one of those northerners and he would have used Nietzsche as an excuse to go get an extra greasy burger from Greg's. <laughs> A munchie box, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> That's so spot on, dude. I love it. Um what's his face uh it's uh, but you do see my point though, is that a lot mm. of people read Nietzsche and it's like nihilism is, exists, everything goes. And then they think, right, what I'm gonna do is reimagine morality to suit me and it's gonna serve me. So morality is here to serve me. And that's so fascinating because that's not what he's saying. He's saying that we should create a new goal and serve it. Yeah. That's a profound difference. And what happens then is morality doesn't become, oh, well, I can just do whatever the fuck they want. Morality becomes, how do we reach that goal? And that's still a highly virtuous and moral way to live. And I found it strange that Jung criticized them in this way. Like, I get what Jung was saying. But I think that's a little bit of a straw man, if I'm to be honest. It's kind of interesting because Nietzsche is not necessarily saying, all right, we can just throw away all values and reinvent all the new ones. He's saying something like, can we set a new goal? That's what I think he's saying. Can yeah. we set a new goal? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I gave the points across uh, in the correct manner. I don't think it, uh, yeah, he wants to create new values. I think you're right. I think there are like a set of all possible values and he wants to just reorganize them in a hierarchy young yeah. frame of wrong frame of course was that regulated by our say psychic evolution we had a psychological law which was rooted in the images and the myths of the collective unconscious and this was also something that dostoevsky hit on when he was like you can't just go and change your values and go yeah. and and go you know arbitrarily and go well can i kill somebody because the unconscious comes and beat you up now there is a way around it which would be you could take nietzsche's frame and also be a wizard like you could become Alistair Crowley, in which case you could control the unconscious and bend it to your will. But then you're just like 57 presumptions away. I, I would like to bring up as well, though, that there are lots of people. We'll, we'll take Paul Joseph Watson as a case study of this. And I like Paul. I think he's entertaining. I don't think his videos are actually what, how he acts in real life. We'll just take that as a case study. Complaining a lot. Yeah. You know, going, there aren't great architecture anymore. Oh, God, look at what the left have done. There's, there's no greatness anymore. Men aren't great. But then you take somebody like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he was a great man. Like the, the dude turned himself into an absolute beast. He literally said to himself, I want to become the highest paid actor in Hollywood, even though I can't speak English. And what did he do? He did. When Terminator 2 came out, that was the biggest salary any movie star had ever been paid. It was something like 10 million or 20 million dollars. And that's in 80s money. And so he actually did turn himself into a great man. So there's a huge disconnect here between sitting there and being a, we'll say, quote unquote, nationalist and complaining and swapping that mindset into I'm actually going to even in the interim, set myself the highest possible goal and become a proper, true Chad alpha male. And there, and that's when you start to realize maybe there is a genetic link here. Maybe it is only for the very, very few because you don't see everybody doing it. It's far easier and more tempting. And maybe implicit in that is they're only capable of falling into a resentful complaining frame. And that's, that's something to consider. That is a really good point. A fantastic point is that, um, like yeah that like it really is like if you don't have a vision and that's one thing that you will note about schwarzenegger if you listen to anything he says he's always talking about vision he always says mm -hmm. visualization i used to visualize the muscle and that would teach me teach the muscle the, uh, he says this he actually says this the will is created by the vision when i visualize my muscles big and strong it would create the desire for me to go to the gym every day and that's um that's very that's, good good accent i like that uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Aust Austrian is a guy nailing that. Inv Invictus will tell me though if it's uh, on point or not. <laughs> yeah, not the Germanics. Um, it's it's that that problem where it's like yes, he sorry that problem that that virtue that he displays where it's it's almost trans political if you wish, and his goal was simply make himself a great body, and you he changed his life from simply having that vision. And most people just lack that, and most people just don't think that way. 
And that becomes super interesting. And if we achieved something like that, would that force us to transcend our small thinking and our bitterness? Like this is Nietzsche's critique of nationalism, I believe, is that the people who ruled Europe were a united pan-European family to a large extent. They weren't nation states. And so if you think you're going to take over, like if you think the right way forward for Europe is to fragment again into national small states, like th that doesn't even make that much sense ethnic um in terms of ethnos like you know the britons the norths are different than the souths and all that and how does this work how do we create a super order and the only way you can do that is have a vision and what is the one vision that people are missing and it seems to be some type of splendor so people that's the boyos there we have just announced our 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 intellectual artistic heritage this is what's going to happen 100% very excited for this although you can go first yeah, true. This is the best quote, James. Do you want to read that? The best quote. Is this what he actually named his essay? Yeah. These Eng oh no, these English <laughs> psychologists who have to be thanked for having made the only attempt so far to write a history of the emergence of morality provide us with a small riddle in the form of themselves. In fact, I admit that as living riddles, they have a significant advantage over their books. They're actually interesting. <laughs> That did make me laugh when I read that in the book. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> it's ruthless. This is John Locke. John They're also Locke. so ugly as well. Look up, oh, yeah. it, like I can't tell who's uglier, Kant or Hegel. It's just a disgrace. It's it, not nice, dude. Yeah, um, yeah. Philosophers aren't known for their Chad looks. Like that's true. Except Nietzsche. And, it, and th this is um this is something that they do critique a lot. They're saying that like m many of these people who are quote unquote thinkers aren't vital people. That was his big critique of Kant more than anything else. It was like he's basically a pussy. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's actually super interesting because it's almost like because you're a pussy, because, all right, there's this Chad Loud dude in the in the social circle and he's always getting all the attention and you're not that person. You decide to yourself, well, I've got to define an identity somehow. So what I'll be is I'll be the, the word guy. I'll be the, the person who, you know, decides, I'll, I'll, I'll philosophize, I'll write in the corner. And so what you do is because you're not like that person, you go and you take that niche, you fill that niche up. And Nietzsche is essentially crit criticizing that niche, saying the most of the people who go into this are just like cucks. They're weak. They're, they're shit. They have no vision. They have no vitality. And they only do this because they can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And why are we letting these people lead our thinking? And that the fuck, that's a crazy, crazy interesting thought. And then um, he begins by making fun of the Brits because the English are a very unique people in the sense that they took over the world using dominance and power and rootlessness. But then at the same time, they were highly Christian. And this tension between these two opposites actually led to them doing some interesting things like ending slavery, for example, but also some interesting trees, things where they would like go into native populations and murder the warrior class and establish a, a Raj like in India and then like sometimes extract usury out of them and sometimes even like pull food out of them and stick them into and genocide them and shit like that. So it was, it was a really interesting clash of morals, if you will, almost like the English instinct was trying to burst out of the, the, the burst out of them and carry them around the world. But at the same time, the Christian thing was pulling them back in and civilizing them. So it's, uh, that's super interesting in one sense. Mm. And then, the, the mindset that grew out of this, this is like English is where we get um, evolution, is where we get uh, the idea of the enlightenment, the idea of mechanical view of the world. All these things stem from England to a large extent. And one thing that they often do is uh, the utilitarians. You'll find that quite interesting. Basically, mm -hmm. what I'm getting at here is that uh, the morality, they tried to make sense of morality before. And what they did is decide that... Um, the reason why we are good, the reason why we are altruistic, the reason why we are kind, the reason why we share is because the person who we shared with thought it was good. And so therefore the, the tag of altruism being good was attached for this reason. People, you know, I give you some food and you'd be like, oh, thanks, Stefan. That's very good of you. And then that's where it came from. This is how the origin of morality happened. And Nietzsche was like, well, that's fucking interesting that you'd say that. They're, they're probably saying that because they want to keep everything fitting in their worldview. This is what he means by the psychologist side of it. But then Nietzsche decided to check this out and say, oh, wow, wait a second. This is not how it happens. 
it happens in a different way when you look through the history. So, uh, James, any thoughts before we bounce into this? Yeah, when you were talking about psychologists, it is interesting because what like, psychologists in many ways are, um, they're a replacement of confession, like Catholic confession, because that's all they used to do. We used to go in, you would get things off your chest, we'll say reveal the inner world to the outside world, and then you'd feel better. And so, yeah, he, he posed a very interesting question at the very beginning of Genealogy of Morals, which is, you know, first of all, we don't know ourselves very well, which is obvious. Like we, we really don't know. We don't know where we're going, for example. We have no idea what's acting within us. So what's the reason for the psychologist pulling out the inner world of all of these patients? It's like, is it, you know, maybe it's because they actually hate Christianity and they want to replace it. It's like, well, why not? Why couldn't it have been something like that? Now, could it just been that they were suspicious of these individuals? Could it have been that they felt good looking at them? So, of course, there is, you know, there's you've got to examine the reasons for it. But, of course, the reason that they give out is that it's good. And Nietzsche, yeah, he doesn't think that the origins of good, which everybody else who came before him thinks is good, he thinks it's something else. And uh, I don't know if you've got this in here, but he actually very interestingly links it to language. The, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, where, where, where the word noble and the word pleb come from. And he's like, that's where it comes from. Not where you think it is, you fluffy puss boy. <laughs> you sub and puff that, yeah? <laughs> Your accent's slowly drifting further and further away. It's going to turn it into Indian very soon. That's where all accents go after a while. Fuck, that's that's annoying. I think I need. I can't do Southern Poster very well. I can do some of the, some of the other things though. I love. I just love North FC though. That is North great. FC. Yeah, it's especially because I'm on I'm on the boundary here between two different parts of of Manchester, and it's like one side is one football team, the other side is another football team. So it's like two North FCs, and they're always fighting and bickering over it. And I just look down from my ivory posh tower and go, decadent. It's cute. <laughs> So speaking of ivory posh towers, um, it turns out when Nietzsche inspected the language, and this is interesting because he does, as he said, he, he does philosophy in a, a very evidence-based way in some sense. And he, he looks literally, he was a philologist, so that means he's someone who inspects words, the etymology of words. He looks through the words and he, he discovers that our original conceptions of good, our value judgments, appear first in history as judgments made by the upper classes about what was good. So you would have the Spartans, as I'm showing here, they would conquer the helots. They were the slave class and they would stand around and they would say, well, what is good to a Spartan? Spartan wouldn't say altruism. They just murdered a load of slaves and enslaved them. They wouldn't say bad is slavery. Why would they say that? They have slaves. They don't, they don't see that in any way. Their vi vitality commands them to impose domination over these slaves. And so their conception of morality reflects what their vitality wants. Now, this is super interesting. The people who had the most vitality got into the position of rulership, and therefore they started to impose on reality what was moral. Morality came from these people when they got this upper position. So what they would start to do is say, well, what is good? What is, what is, what is good is what increases vitality, what makes us us, because we are the most vital. So whatever makes us us is good. And so they would say, we are good. They would just do it that simply to be like, like the alpha male in the, in the social circle. It's like, what is good? And he, he would just be like, I am good. <laughs> and it's, it's like everything around that victory, strength, conquest, domination, success, winning, you know, what's good winning. What do you like winning yeah. festivals, celebrations, their reality, their vitality, all the culture that they make their ways of doing things, their works, their, their, um, their poets, people who celebrate them. It all became centralized in this sense. And this is what we call master morality. It's someone who has a strong mental point of origin, a strong soul frame inside their own head who give a shit about their reality and they prove it. It's, it's like, it's obvious. There's no, you can't rational. There's no need to rationalize. There's no need for philosophers. None of that shit is that matters at all. And this is what we what I meant by that first quote from some guy on Twitter is that uh, it's innate, it's built in. You know you are the real deal because you're the powerful one. You're the one who have conquered. There's no way around it. It's just obvious. And therefore, what you say is good is what you are. Yeah, an example that he uses to sort of proof that because you consider that you know arbitrary. Is that really good and bad? He's like, yeah, well, if you are noble, if you are powerful, you aren't kidding yourself about how happy you are about your life. Yes. Whereas, whereas, whereas the slave lower classes aren't very happy because they've got that venomous resentment within them. And that's actually really sharp. And I can't really get a crowbar under that. 
like, huh, okay, maybe, maybe. Of course, there are, you could perhaps uh, open up potential issues with that if you contrast him against somebody like Viktor Frankl, who believed that a more spiritual meaning sustained you more than some kind of outside power and social structure. So there's something to to consider and perhaps buffer against that. But that was the proof that he gave anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a very interesting way of thinking. And I, I actually, we don't cover that in this. We'll talk about it perhaps in the next one because uh, that's when he starts, that's the sections where he talks about it. This is more just about setting up this idea between classes. And I love that word pleb, by the way. I'm actually quite nervous to use the word pleb because there was an, I think it was an MP or a CEO who called somebody a pleb and he got into massive trouble. Jesus Apparently it is a, it's, it's not just a swear word, it's seen as a derogatory term. And you can see that slave morality coming up. How dare you call us plebs? No, 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 we're on the same equality as you. Yeah. Oh, I, also, I just thought there, another example of this, if you consider the, I think we're all familiar with this, would be the election cycle in 2016 in the States where you had Trump and so you had everyone on the other side and they were sort of all just like fluffy. They wanted to have compassion for poor people, whatever. It was all about equality and fairness. Whereas Trump was like, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. And people were electrified by that. And we haven't seen a presidential candidate do that before. Now, I'm not going to say that Trump is the is the, you know, the culmination of master morality, but that's a good parallel where it's like winning versus we should all be the same. And people who are above us are just corrupting and oppressing us yeah yeah and that that's that's like in order to understand what this means the, these 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 monsters these masters and monsters is a good way to think about them because they would be savages they would be people who would murder you in order to establish their rule over you like it, it, this is what the nobles were of the past they were the people who were the most brutal the most powerful the most strongest and the helots like the way the spartan street the helots was fucking crazy man it's so hard to get your head around it they used to release their young teenage men to go out and kill a few helots as like a trial of initiation and this was contrasted against what the upper classes saw as the bad now as i said the anglo-saxons would have come in and conquered the britons the britons would have been the lower class the bad these would be the vulgar people the plebs now what does vulgar mean vulgar means unrefined so we might sort of see this as like the snobs giving out about the about the the you know the people who are more coarse or the, the people who are lower class the poor people who are lower class but what these upper class people are, are almost describing them as unsophisticated mm. vulgar means like cursing you know so these would be the people who don't speak eloquently they have this sort of uh ugly way of talking in some sense and they, they are just generally considered lower. These are the people who are conquered. They weren't sophisticated and civilized enough to take over because back in these days, we consider civilization now and there's this tone of like tameness to it. But back in these days, civilization represented your ability to control your vitality and direct it in a forceful way. The Romans weren't necessarily as big as the Germans, the blonde Germans, but they were able to beat them because they were more organized. They had more control over their will to power, their wills to max. And that's what we're sort of getting at here is this interesting blend of whatever got them on top led them to be sophisticated, controlled, um, brutal as well, ruthless, uh, have huge ambition, b think big in all these things, all these virtues that they would consider versus the things that didn't put them in control. And these is what we consider bad. This is the original morality. It was a vulgarness, um, being plebeian being you know laziness ugly lower all these type of things and there's a myth in greek for pan and apollo where you have pan who is um the 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 man of the forest and pan is like playing a violin or something like that and it's just really the, some of the satyrs they're all playing this really like folk song pretty much and apollo plays this wonderful classical classical piece representative of the upper classes and Pan listens to it. They have a competition, and the pa Apollo plays this great piece, and Pan plays his thing, and you know, it's like everybody's like Apollo's thing is way better, and Pan's just like, shut the fuck up. I love my fucking song, and then he runs off and keeps playing it, and he doesn't care at all. And then, like all the rest of them are like, for fuck's sake, that dude, like he just he just doesn't listen to the reality that Apollo was better, and um, and that's that's the the interesting way of framing this is like Pan is almost like the god of the people of the field in some sense. And so what the the reason why this matters is because when the Anglo-Saxons come in, when the when the Normans come in, when the 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 ruling uh, Norse people come in and take over the Britons and the Irish and establish this monarchy, they need very very important that they keep their distance from the people who they conquer. The people who they conquer need to know that they are the servants. They need to know that they're lower down in that caste. 
And so all of this language is is used in this way. It's designed to keep them understanding their place. And morality is designed to keep them understanding their place. They need to understand that they're servants in some sense. And the upper classes need to understand that they're better than those people in order to keep them as separate because there's this fear that if the the upper classes mingle too much with the lower classes, what will happen is it will bring the upper classes down. It will damage the upper classes' natural vitality. Like if you start mingling with the lower classes, you become more vulgar. And that's not a good thing. If you become more like the people who are conquered, that's essentially like you becoming more weak. So you shouldn't do that. And that's this is where you can see this morality is is orientating itself around how the upper classes try to manage themselves. And all of our great liter literature comes from the upper classes. Much of our science comes from the upper classes. Many of the original scientists were people of noble stock who were doing stuff in their spare time. Homer's Odyssey and all that, like all these great works of the past weren't coming out of the plebs. These people didn't know how to write. Um, these these great works were coming out of the, the ruling classes who were reasserting the reality in some sense. And so you can even see that these were the artistic creative people as well. Yeah, they were if they weren't written by the upper classes or say the very upper classes, they were often patronized by people of the upper classes. And there are lots of very famous portraits throughout English history, which, of course, is what I'm most familiar with, where they would have like the king sitting there and somebody gifting them a great work. And oftentimes there would be characters within that that would be praising them. If you consider Virgil's Aeneid, the founding myth of Rome, he was writing Augustus into that and including Augustus in the future, like the, the, the character Aeneas, he had a vision of Augustus in the future. And it was all about that um, serving some kind of higher purpose. Now, there are a few characters throughout history that perhaps didn't go ahead and do that. So someone like Shakespeare, for, for example, mm -hmm. um, or, the, or the Bronte sisters, you know, Wuthering Heights. But you are right. Most of them do seem to come from the upper classes. Now, you can throw into that if it's a case of education, which it, it, it may well be, or if it is that being in touch with the divine muse that if you are an unsophisticated individual, you'll be more chaotic. So it's like, why would being sophisticated be a better thing? It's almost like having more control and order around the scenario around you. There's less, everything has conscious deliberation behind it so that there's less chance for chaos to sort of erupt for that, for that Eros idea to just come and explode and tear everything apart. So yeah, it's an interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is essentially it is it comes down to, whatever the upper class has learned, whatever these people learned from establishing their, their power, they learned that the lower classes were different than them. The, like the Britons, the black haired, dark haired Britons were different than the invading Anglo-Saxons. And like yeah. the Irish were different than the invading English at, at the later stages or the Vikings. You could even say they were, they were lesser and they were not to be blended with. They were of worse stock. You know, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't good enough. They just simply weren't. And that's the reason why they were conquered. It's very, you know, it's a very straightforward way of thinking. If they were good enough, they wouldn't have been conquered. They weren't good enough. Therefore, they're the slaves. Do not mix with something that's not good enough. Stay away from it. Keep a distance, a pathos of distance. This is reinforcing the idea of hierarchy, inequality, cardinal sins in the modern world. You can't talk about this stuff. But Nietzsche was like, these things all existed in this way. This is, this is how it's, um, it, it worked. And this yep. is reinforced through language. We'll talk about that now in a second. He just warns that what happens is when the ruling class weakens, or you could say when they over-civilize, the plebs over a long period of time start to gain power. They start to niggle their way back into a position of authority. They start, the, the upper class create this hierarchy of power, and then they create these political institutions around it. And then what happens is over time, the, the lower classes start to find their way into it. They start to promote things like changing the language from asserting this distance and inequality to this idea of we're all the same we're all valuable they start promoting this idea of compassion of understanding the pleb as the same of of the same soul as the aristocrat and ultimately sharing in their burden and from sharing in their burden you get the idea of sharing power and this is when you get the idea of democracy and what this does is this flattens these hierarchies to the point where the plebs get angry enough or they, they get they get a sniff that the upper classes are weak enough that they can take them over. And this is where you get things like the French Revolution. And that's a, a very interesting idea Nietzsche, Nietzsche puts forward there is that the revolt of the slave in some sense is when that lower class finally takes over, finally over an extended period of, of culture war, if you will, 
get has that political capital ready to do this to take the power from them so linguistically nietzsche runs through how all this stuff manifests he he shows he he displays evidence and it's pretty pretty crazy first idea is that the tags of good all seem to relate back to stem back to this idea of nob nobility and um, class yes yeah, so th the way i describe this is we even do it nowadays like if someone does something good you're like oh in ireland you go that's class you'd be like that's classy or that's the proper way to do things that's the the sophisticated way to do things whereas if someone does something that's crude ugly you would say it's tasteless that's classless that's vulgar like say if you see a north and he's like way too drunk in the street you're like man dude you're being you're being classless you're being vulgar like you know pull yourself together and these these are implicit ideas that actually do seem to stem back to this original value judgment class classy proper was tied to good tasteless class as vulgar was tied to not good was tied to bad and good behaviors are acting with this aristocratic soul in this way this is what we mean acting classy acting sophisticated acting proud you know acting vital acting strong and then um, he shows in german you have bad schlecht is related to modest schlicht and simply schlecht weg i.e the simple man the, the the peasant the pleb the lower man and it was only in the 1600s that this evolved into the modern world bad mm. Now he notes further, so that's a really interesting thing coming out of German because you see Schlecht, the word bad in German, das ist Schlecht, mein Deutsch ist Schlecht. That is tied to the idea of um, simplicity, of, of like, I guess you could say the, the non-sophisticated simplicity. Now then he noticed that the rulers named themselves by noting their superiority, as I was saying before, they would call themselves the great, Alexander the Great, you know? And um, they, they would literally name themselves the powerful. The way we think of the the way we use the word rich nowadays, I am rich. Like that's super interesting, isn't it? Uh, I'm a millionaire. Like what are you doing there? You're you're categorizing yourself as separate from everyone else due to uh, like something that's undeniable, which is your power, your superiority. I am, who are you? Oh, I'm a millionaire. I made loads of money off finance or something like that. That's super interesting. And then you think about quote unquote like the left what they are giving out about they're like the one percent what is the one percent it's tagging people as the rich elite the powerful the lords the rich the possessors these are the overclass and we still have them today and um you'll you'll find this interesting the iranians and the slavs they would have uh the the language shows that the word aria comes from this this is where we, Arya is represented of the idea of nobles, of the possessors, the, the lords, the rich, the powerful. And this is where we get the word the Aryans from. And this is um, where we get the, the idea. Iranian is actually a modification of the word Aryan, Iranian Aryan in that sense. And so that you hear people talk about the, the Aryan race, which is, of course, a very naughty word nowadays. But this is where it came from. This is, this is why this is such a big deal. When they talk about the master race, this is what they were talking about here. It was stemmed in this historical basis. Whoops. And so the Greeks called themselves the truthful. This is one thing they noticed, that the, the Greeks had this habit of being like, we, we are the, the people who say the truth, which is interesting. Mm. And we are the people who exist. We are the truth. We own reality. The vulgar man is, is vulgar because he does not own reality. He does not command reality. He is not true. He does not see things as they are. The vulgar man has to lie to himself. And doesn't the vulgar man have to do that? Doesn't the vulgar man have to say, oh, he's he's not rich because he's better than me. He's rich because he's evil. Is Doesn't that what the vulgar man have to do? He has to lie. Whereas the Greeks would be like, well, we tell the truth. We are reality. We see things clearly. And so the vulgar man, the lower man, is his reality is because he is dishonest, unambitious, and cowardly. And then when we look at Latin, which is the Roman language, we see malus. It's tied up with the idea of dark hair or darkness. And we'll get into that in a second. Because isn't, isn't dark related to darkness? Is also related to evil, dark, dark. You know, you think of shadows, you think of evil. And mm -hmm. um, malevolent, there's an interesting word. In French, I believe you have mal, which is bad. And we'll talk about bon, which is good later. Bon is good for French. And uh, mal shows up as negative. And so this idea of dark hair is, is wrapped up with the idea of the natives. That's what's an interesting thing is that, as I was saying before, the Britons would have had darker hair than those evading uh, blonde tribes. And 
this is interesting. Like, obviously, you get in trouble for talking about that in that context. But being Irish, being a slave race, I can talk about this because when you study our myths, you see that we had an original race called the Fomorians. And our mythology is centered around this invading glorious race who were the master races called the Tuatha Dana. And what they did is they were invading blonde gods. They were um, the, the people of uh, the, the, the light yellow, golden, shining people who invaded Ireland. And what they did is they subjugated the Fomorians who were considered these like s short, they, they, they often like describe them as these like short hobbit-like, orc-like, ugly, half, you know, physiologically inferior monster races. And this was obviously the, this is obviously the incredibly intense racist Tua De Dana describing the native people as these like demons that they were supposed to kill off pretty much. And in, in Irish, you have this word called Finn, like in Fingal, and that Finn means blonde. And so you have that same dynamic going on there. And um, yes, the, the Roman Latin, furthermore, in the Roman Latin, you get this idea of bonus, which is exceptional, unequal, unlike the rest. Nietzsche relates it to donus, and this is the name for the warrior. Um, French, a Latin language, you have bon, which is good, bonus, bon, like you see the connection there. And this is, again, putting this idea of separate distance exceptional better unequal over superior that's your roman latin and the very very last one to drive it home like nothing else this is our english word god this is related to the german word gut and our word good and what more is the idea of god than the idea of the good the godlike people the gods the godlike race and what was the original german race this is the german race that took over Europe after Rome fell. The Visigoths, the Goths, that's where it all stemmed from. And so, yes, James, any thoughts before we go on? No, it's 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 based, dude. I don't you you can't you can't throw this away. It's like it clearly good and evil have been related to the characteristics which the ruling class had being good and which the lower classes had, which is bad. Now, that doesn't mean that the essence of good and bad is exclusively tied to the capabilities of those people, but clearly that's what people in the past used to think, which it doesn't mean that our origins of good and bad is simply, well, you know, it's just kind of what was useful in the past for everybody, and we've since kind of forgotten, because that's what the English psychologists at the time would have been saying. It's something more um, unpleasant than that, I'll say. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, and we will talk about how this uh, the history changed, how this changed throughout history, because it seems like during, shall we say, proto modern times or proto, you can say proto Christian times, if you want, this is the way people felt the world. They felt the world in this way. Now, it, now the question is, is the reason why this happened? Because these overlords, these masters literally possessed the, the creative power of the world like all the literature we read comes from these people so is this obviously what they're going to express and it was the revolution of uh the slaves it was the revolution of christianity when human civilization evolved to the point where the lower classes could start voicing their perspective and that's why we started getting a new good and evil like maybe it was a con for example after the the gutenberg press after the printing press surely that was an example of um why suddenly you're going to start seeing a lot more perspectives and throwing us into this postmodern conundrum that we have and, and whatnot. But it's a very interesting, very interesting map he lays out. And it's, it's very based, like a lot of the stuff he's talking about there, very, 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 very grounded in mythology. Like you look through any mythology from most places around the world and you even look at the historical maps and it, it is these invading tribes who establish a monarchy and they tend to have this um, this dynamism about them, this vitality, and they enslave the the unvital locals. So yeah, so this isn't going to be a proof of objective morality being being by nature of you being rich that makes you good. That's not what he's saying. He's not interested in an objective morality in that sense. But at the very least, what that etymo etymological investigation is doing is just getting the reader to think that perhaps good does not necessarily equal Christ as objective value. Good does not equal self-sacrifice. It is not always meant self-sacrifice. Therefore, is there a relative nature to it, focusing around yeah. some kind of nexus point, which does have nested within it some kind of utility or some kind of power-based structure. So, which again is unpleasant to consider. It's, I mo imagine most people are like, no, there is such a thing as good and bad. No, but it's like Nietzsche's like, stop being, stop being a puss boy. 
and uh, put on your big boy pants and just get on with it. And this is the really important thing to understand is that he's trying to drive home the idea that you've got to look at the societies that these people manifested using this model of good and evil. And um, so the people who had these more ruthless models of good and evil tend to produce very good societies. It's hard to argue against the Greeks. The Greeks are in, uh, like a, an example of an astoundingly profound good culture. Like it's it's almost like objective the way that you can you can say Greek culture was beautiful and it's I'm glad that we have it. I wouldn't sacrifice that. Now, in order for you to do that, you must come to the conclusion. You must accept what Nietzsche is discovering here that they had this dyna dynamism of we are the truthful versus the vulgar people who are the the under underlings, if you will. The Latins, man, like it's hard to just throw away the Roman Empire. It's the same problem. It's the same problem. You must say, okay, well, the Romans were great. How do we understand how like sure we have to digest then that since the Romans were great, their model of good and evil was useful, was could you say closer to correct in the sense of getting a splendor, splendorous society after all? And the German society of the 16th century was fantastic as well. Nietzsche was a German, for example. And um they they like all classical music comes from this period and whatnot. So they they have these problems. Like this, this is a big problem. This is a really big problem, and it's all there. Um, and then so here's the last question I want to just push out is that it's very interesting where we are in terms of an identity in the modern world because we have this conception where we're all white people and uh, we're all nationalists or something like that. We're all stuck in nations. And that's super interesting because as far as I can see, Nietzsche is punching both of those things firmly in the stomach. And um, he's suggesting on the one hand that the reason why a lot of these values are, are, are starting to fall is because we have now unified ourselves as all the same people instead of understanding that there was originally a ruling caste in Europe. And then what we've done now is we've started to, us, us, us people who were previously those natives, like I think I've, I've got that look about me. I think I'm a brown haired fuck. Like I think I would have been one of those, those, those vulgar natives. And what that means is that we, we think that we are all the same as those people who would have been of her, like higher bloodlines, if you want. And, um, we are now like unifying our categories under this democracy idea. But what this is doing is this is sort of, you had these peaks, you had this great, great, great pyramid. And then these people at the top. And now that we're reducing this pyramid, we're democratizing that pyramid. These people are all blending into one, but that's not a good thing because what that's doing is that's actually, that's actually pulling the best down into, to a lower level. And so we're losing that exceptional top nature that would lead us in some sense we're destroying the greatness in us for the sake of of making us feel like we're all the same that's what we're doing we're sacrificing the the great european powers that produced all our great literature well a lot of our great literature for the sake of us not feeling like we're inferior simply and that's um that's a scary idea what are we sacrificing and then we're we're falling into this frame is that like we're all white people or some shit like that we're all the same in that type of sense and that's 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 again our democracy coming in trying to find an identity like what is the, what is the same about us how do we all relate to each other before we would have understood ourselves as plebs underneath the the ruling class and like you know the pleb reality might not have been just this as horrible as they make it out to be but uh, you know what i mean we would have had these identities perhaps we would have had christian like who knows maybe that was the unifying thing but now that we've lost all that we're stuck where there's no conception of class there's no conception of of, of of ethnicity like the norths don't really understand that they're hereditary probably a separate tribe than the angles down below and so we're all blending into this big mess that has no clear identity and we think that we're these like white people when we're in fact probably the ruled people to a large extent maybe maybe james's uh mother's side though maybe maybe he's got a little bit of that 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 royal blood the fucker who knows not for many hundreds of years which really upset me when i tried to oh, trace yeah. it back there's That's zero okay. it's pure plebeian commoner yeah, that, that doesn't down. that doesn't appeal to my to my posh sensibilities which is very upsetting i want to ask you a question though so take uh, i want to see how this might might play out in terms of christianity so he really nietzsche really liked the renaissance he thought that they had uh, those little pagan influences of that excellence mindset was splashed back in and we were able to scale up to up to god you know we produced a wonderful society and and nietzsche seemed to quite like that so it's not as if he's against christianity as such mm -hmm. it's almost like he's saying i'm against christianity for the ruling classes 
So it, in many ways, it's similar to what Karl Marx said. I hate, I can't believe I've actually said that, which is religion is the opiate of the masses. So <laughs> I, I, I would yeah. almost imagine him, if he was here, he obviously could clear this up, but to say the common folk, the people at the bottom caste, the slave caste, you know, maybe the farming caste as well, they can have their Christianity and that keeps them happy. But the top ruling class should not be in that case. The top ruling class should read me and copy what I'm saying, because otherwise, if we all go Christian, then that will cause a slave revolt and everything will collapse. So in many ways, what you could perhaps see is that in the British Empire days, when things were more glorious, you could say that well, the top people weren't acting very Christian, even though everyone else down the bottom was. So I wondered what you thought of that frame. I think there's something to that, yeah. I'm not sure now how to, how to square that circle, because that is a tough one. Um, but the problem is that no matter how much you want to say it, the ruling, the, the elite have always been anti-Christian. They've always been a, an approximation of paganism of some sort. Like That's always how it's worked. To, to a large extent like the, even the romans when christianity showed up they got pissed off so what they did is they adopted it and turned it into roman catholicism which is this sort of like pagan version of christianity and this is interesting and i think this does does credit um some idea that christianity has like value to it and i think even nietzsche recognized that only that it's it might not be something that's useful universally or something like that like maybe it doesn't suit the monarchs but maybe it does i don't really know but there is there is something to that that question nonetheless like uh he doesn't he likes the church as well he thinks the church is a fantastic institution and there's it's it's stupid to throw away the church but um the question is like what what morals do we teach through the church like for example modern christianity is teaching some very very interesting morals considering where its traditional morality was supposed to sit and yeah. that's the, that's a profound idea because as much as we want to say Christianity is like you know as much as you don't want to slander Christianity, you can see that Christianity itself as an institution is suffering from all these strange uh, intellectual Euro Buddhism that we're suffering from as well. Like it's all happening in some sense. So yeah, so it depends what you mean by Christianity. And that, yes, in, yeah. at, at, at the very least, going through Nietzsche's stuff, you have to examine what actually takes place. I've said this several times on streams, but the Christianity I was brought up with was just cuddle, cuddle each other, and we'll all go to heaven. Even if you don't, even if you don't believe in Jesus, God will still intercede for you, and He'll take you up to heaven. And that is just plain fluff. It's, it's nonsense. That, well, that's not what Christ said. That's not what historically what the church has been all about. So maybe there has to be a revaluation of Christian values to go in line with what it was actually saying. And I think that's what we were covering in Ion, essentially, was that Christianity is nowhere near as cuddly as we think it is. Not only is it perhaps yes. innate to our psychological law, but it's not as cuddly. So that could be a solution in order to square both of them to say that maybe Christianity is the way to go. Maybe it is a masterful idea. We've just interpreted it all wrong. Yeah, that could be in the Gnostics, for example, something like that. So by no means is, does this become a simple case of throw Christianity away, which it is also makes it very difficult to tackle because it's not an easy frame to then figure out. There's a lot of, because this is 150 years later and it's so timely and turned out to all be true, a lot of those details start popping up. So It's a tough one. The Christian question is a tough one because Nietzsche will later in this book like he he will he'll point very hard at christianity like he he hits a he he hits a knockout blow and the questions are like will it stand up again um and it, that's it's not out of the it's not out of the question will it climb back up again but it's some some very very hard hits whatnot. yeah but it would have to have to transform severely from what it currently is 100 percent. yeah that, that's probably the best way to think about it nonetheless in terms of our identity our identity is tied to our morality, and I do think there's something very interesting about the way we identify now. Like we consider ourselves white, even though, like as an Irish person, for me to consider myself as sharing the burden of the of uh, like me considering myself as, for example, you'll meet people who will blame you for slavery for being white, and then the idea that an Irish person is to blame for slavery is very, 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 very strange because we were largely slaves in some mm. sense. And even to to blame a British person, like to go to a North and say, "Oh, you you were slave owners," is it's like there's something insane about that because these people were the people who were driven down into mines and, and forced to work in some sense. And the people in Greece, like there were helots in Greece as much as there were Spartans. So there's something very strange about this, where because we've lost our ability to to really understand the the inequality that was fundamental to how we organized things in the past we've lost a large amount in terms of understanding the reality of what's going on and we're falling into this weird democratic um blend that's destroying our identity or putting us in a dangerous place to say the least
Yeah, this was so, a, a problem that troubled me when I was younger. And I was looking at my passport and it said, you're an Englishman. And I was like, mummy, I'm not an Englishman, though. I'm half Irish. And she was like, oh, son, don't be proud of that. The Irish are a disgusting race of pigmen. The pig oh, dis disgusting. But it, it, is, it is a good question. It's like, what the hell am I? And, you know, if you've got any kind of mixed race blood in you at the highest resolution of race. So it's like, well, there's Norman and there's Viking and there's Celt and there's Roman. And there's, so what the hell does that mean? And so, of course, Nietzsche's frame would be we need to go pan-European. And it's like, well, that is what we currently are. So like it's highly doubtful you are a that a tribe one day popped into existence, put its roots in the ground and then has remained static and closed from all immigration throughout forever. So it's like yeah. maybe we are a European people. Now, of course, in, in the more um, more mixed race, open immigration to the rest of the world society, that then becomes a huge difficulty. But it's definitely an interesting idea that especially because Europe, they've wanted to fight over land for a long period of time. But at the same time, they were hugely um, there was a huge flow of people like John Milton was massively inspired to write Paradise Lost by going to speak to the old blind Galileo in Italy. So that you've got to have that communication across. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe Europe is the canonical identification. I don't know, but it's just an interesting question that troubled me. Yeah, it's really hard to know because it's like there's there's some implication here that the identity that might sue is this idea of uh, an elite that are trans European or something like that, pan European, and they create a pan European identity of some sort. I don't know that, that, how does that sit well. It also puts some problems with the nationalism idea because if we go back into our nationalism and make that mistake of believing that like we're all Britons or we're all English or we're all Irish, even though like our myths tell us that there was a separate people. And if you walk around Ireland, you'll see people who look like me. You'll see people who look more dark haired. You'll see people who look literally like Vikings. Like it's it's all blended in together. And uh, oh, thank you, thank you for the super chat, sir. Thank you for the super chat. We got a skip can over people. By the way, we must say check out Skip's work. He we have covered Ion, but Skip is a G. He is a he is a veteran, war veteran, been through the wars. He is properly. If he was back in those Spartan days, he probably would have been the overlord of everything. So uh, he's yeah. that type of chap. Check him out. He's got a great channel. Yeah, Skip, um, Skip is one of the most delightful gentlemen I've come across. Sincerely, thank you, Skip. I appreciate you. Um, the. The, uh, the what was I saying again? The uh, yes, the idea that our, our nationalism is is something that will help us. Like and again, just grading against this idea. Like I really don't understand politics enough to make severe statements about it. But you have to understand this is that the biggest problem we have is identity and identifying as this. 18th century idea which is nationalism is is sort of great and the democracy that comes with that is sort of grading against the idea that Nietzsche is suggesting here where why do you think that works that's actually a Christian idea in some sense your belief that you're all equal whereas Nietzsche's like the the evidence shows that we are any equal in the way that we operate and it might be smarter to try create a geopolitical unified pan-european idea or something like that and how would that work because that's what the christian monarchs work the christian monarchs were a pan-european ideal that ruled over all of europe and they were reinforced by the church in some sense and once the church was over once the the protestantism thing happened a lot of this stuff started to crumble and weaken and i guess this gives credit to what young was saying is that the ion antichrist thing is interesting in that what that did is that pulled everybody out of those hierarchies and into this weird mush that we have now and we think that's freedom even though we're just more confused except for the norths who understand exactly what's going on and we know exactly who our enemy is and it's james <laughs> well the ion theory does offer an interesting alternative to what nisha is saying where it looks like that you know the aeon of pisces or aeon of aries we were like the romans for example and then the aeon of pisces we just we fragmented across two thousand years through the mystical realm known as psyche and we were forced to experience beat by beat all the different types of spiritual to material so it's like well christianity didn't work for the first 1000 years you might lay out and go well yeah because they were all just weak but that's not necessarily what christianity means in the jungian light because you then would have to unify that and this is where jung's a heretic you then have to unify that with the more anti-christian way of doing things and there's no one else i could possibly think who would personify the anti-christian energy than nietzsche he even went mad and started identifying as christ like he 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 what i can't think of anyone else maybe maybe napoleon i don't know but so maybe it is a synthesis that you need to do together. And it's very interesting considering the Aeon of Aquarius was the next one we're meant to go into, which was we become the water bearers. 
That's very similar to Nietzsche's Superman. Not completely. There's some shadow elements there, but that's very similar to Nietzsche's Superman. So it's as if both are tackling in the same direction and perhaps the two need to fuse together at some point. And that's that's a problem I want to solve. That's something I'm excited about because there's going forward with Nietzsche's ideas on a political realm that is almost non-functional without strong action being taken. But then you'd have to deviate from his works in many ways. He's, he's laying out the dream the dream for which we are meant to build something like that it's not a manifesto do you think um do you think we can call it the water boyos the water boyos instead of water bearers the water boyos how is see, that see i thought of of waterboarding when you said that <laughs> which is what the english should be doing to the irish to keep your <laughs> i swear to god i swear to man north revolution like it's gonna happen you just gotta watch it i'm i'm recording all this and i'm gonna document it and be like this is this will be your 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 trial we'll crush your testicles and make you confess to all this that, that what's going on all, all right choices when i hear you say nonsense like that it's like oh the lower castes at least they're amusing themselves <laughs> you know i really i really tried to i really tried to make this presentation pc but like nietzsche's pretty much like the first line is irish are the master race and then he just continues to show how the Finns and all this we, we should be the ones ruling portraits of him with big muscles just going like this is what excellence looks like you puss yeah here we we're running very long and people are sometimes complaining about our four hour stream so let's um do you have any patreon questions there and uh, yeah. i'll see what's going on in the chat yes there's actually a patreon question that that fits very nicely into this beautiful so, let's yeah. list it out we'll take one one maybe one or two and then we've got to bounce guys because we don't want to get it running too long um i'm just gonna say hello to a few people though first okay uh, uh, alex alex yo if you're here post 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 modern alert that's fucking damn right Thomas is a beast. How are you doing, sir? Uh, Mastero, Danny, Unker Kun, Machun. What's the crack? What's the crack? Hello, people. Flying banana. Flying banana. Um, Derelisk. Derelisk. Could I be some subconsciously taking part in some 2,000-year-old virtue signaling? Most certainly, if Nietzsche's right about Christianity. Uh, I hate Google. <laughs> Nietzsche. Interesting points in Buddhism. Neil Dennison, Chad Kangaroos, that's the job. Joshua Boardman. Greg's doesn't sell greasy burgers, you savannah, but but it's greasy, I delicious. Know, I, know, I know I may misspoke there. They're actually it's quite nice bread, but the way the northern the Norths they flock to Greg's, they'll come into work with like a Greg's burger that was reduced, just fresh. It's like I don't understand. I don't understand this. It's like eat proper food, not Greg's. You, it doesn't sound nice, does it, Greg's? Um, this <laughs> Joshua, you fucking suffer. You just don't get it, James. I'm sorry. North, North Revolution, guys. I stand with the North. I stand with them. Be wary of the North, James. Do you ever watch Game of Thrones? You are a decadent, and you are disgusting. Kelly Crozier says, "Cheers from Canada." This is such a relevant topic. Thank you, Kelly Thomas. I enjoyed this book. Beautiful and skip again. All right, beautiful, beautiful, sir, beautiful, sir. Um, drop us, drop us a question there, and we'll we'll rip into it. Cool. So there seems to be a tension between the concept of Christianity as bringing about the primacy of individualism in the West, something JBP has echoed, and the Nietzschean idea of Christianity enforcing a slave or a herd morality. Which do you think is more favourable? The answer would help to better understand whether or not it is the idea of liberty or the lack thereof as anti-Christian. Or do you think there's even a tension at all? What do you think, sir? Oh, Jesus. Fucking hell. Um, if you want to reframe Christianity in some sense, you can think that there's no implication that there is liberty as a, as a cardinal value. The, the old idea of Christianity is that virtue is the cardinal value. Like you, you, you behave virtuously and through that you achieve liberty. And if you want to think about an older way of thinking, that's the same way of thinking. You behave virtuously, you achieve liberty. Liberty is a consequence of acting virtuous. So the weird reframing we have now of uh, liberty uberales is a distortion in some sense of what we could call natural order, where liberty is something you create. Like the Spartans who took over the helots would understand themselves as the masters because they created liberty for themselves and they took liberty from the slaves. And they did that through their morality, their virtuous actions, which they would consider domination, enslavement, rootlessness, and beating up the, the, the weak. And so um, the Christians in some sense would have a similar idea in a weird way. They say the freedom is created through behaving the right way and that creates your freedom freedom from mental slavery if you will now nietzsche would go on to say something like the reason why 
the the people needed freedom from mental slavery is because they were the helots, because they were the lower classes, and so they didn't feel happy. They felt dominated. They felt weaker, lesser. And so what they needed to do in order to justify their existence to themselves was get this get this spiritual way of, of dealing with their 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 negative the negative emotions in some sense. And so Christianity was this way of of cooking of 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 culling off your your idea of um of needing ambitions and all this and that that would be his critique of that but that's a very cynical critique you can still also say that in some sense christianity is just this intelligent version of stoicism that taught you how to deal with your emotions and channel them towards the good like you can still find i think in christ's words this idea of reach for the stars and orientate your morality in that direction as well yeah yeah I think it's a good idea. I will also say that I don't think it's innate to Christianity, as you were saying, the idea of of liberalism and being free, because the idea of free has changed. I think it was a, an ancient Greek philosopher, which makes me sound very profound because I don't read the Greek philosophers. I just came across this. The ancient idea of freedom was being free from your vices, whereas the modern idea of freedom played out in the political realm, of course, is being free to engage in your vices. Yeah, and if yeah. Of course, there's an infinite amount of freedom. You can fractionate that down all the way, all the way down, and that then becomes tolerance because the implicit assumption is if you are free to engage in your vices, I am not free to judge you, and I am not free to stop you doing that. That's not itself a Christian virtue. So, mm -hmm. is it plays itself out on a political frame? I don't think is implicit within Christianity. Now, there also comes into uh, you, we will have to address Nietzsche's opinion on Christ, which is very contentious. And uh, I, I personally don't jive with it. I think there's something to it, right? but I don't necessarily jive with it. But that's not not important where it, it, we'll cover that, I think, probably in the next video that we do, maybe the one after. But there is the idea in, in Christianity, which Jung pointed out, which was perhaps you're not meant to just bend the knee to Christ. And, be res and that comes from being resentful to the upper classes. Perhaps what you're meant to do is become Christ. Now, that's what he says in the Red Book. He says that explicitly. Don't follow Christ because Christ was a man for a previous age and he was following himself in many ways. You mm -hmm. become your own Christ. And that is actually echoed in the canonical Gospels, as well as in some of the um, the Apocrypha of the New Testament, as well as in Mormonism, as well as you have to go become a God yourself, which echoes that Nietzschean idea of the Superman. So if that was the canonical Christianity we should have taken, rather than suppressing that side of things, perhaps due to herd morality, suppressing the true nature of Christianity, then you can see the idea of the Superman actually being apparent in both of them. So yes. like how it plays out on the political frame, that then enters a very interesting question. And now you'll find this fascinating, is that what we've set up is this dichotomy of the, the masters, the ruling classes. And so when people usually read this far into the book, they're like, yeah, I'm going to become a master. Fucking masters are class. Fuck slaves. Slaves are gay. I hate slaves. I'm not going to become a slave. No one wants to be a slave. But then Nietzsche's going to go and explain to you why the slaves win and beat the masters all the time. Um, and this is super interesting. And he starts to explain that there's something to slave morality that's valuable, and it is its ability to tame its vitality. And it comes to a point where you realize that the only way forward will be this unity between the master and the slave. And that's what he believes the Superman will be. Someone who can take the the unbelievably self, the unbelievable self-denial and self-control of slave morality and direct it towards something great. And that might be that idea of um taking something like Christianity, considered a herd or slave morality, and liberating it from um its more negative spins that it's getting now and direct it somewhere. So yes, there definitely is something to that. Definitely something to that. Yeah, that's very exciting going forward. There's another question here, which I think fits nicely with this. This comes from Invictus. Hello. Let's let's do the last. This is the last question. We've got to bounce. Mm -hmm. um, it, well, it fits quite nicely with this. How do you manage with fear of success? Um, every now and then when I make big leaps forward, people open up doors for me and I seek out my ability and my knowledge. However, I hesitate to walk through the doors and sometimes sabotage myself at peak times with taking it slow or giving myself dumb leisure time reading thought read thoughts and prevent further growth so how do you deal with your fear of success and this i think ties up very nicely with nietzsche and indeed what the boyo project is trying to do in it's one of its newer forms which is to overcome fear essentially because that's the thing that's holding you back from excellence so what do you think about that you irish potato eating so we talked a little bit about the, the fact that the the ruling class seemed to come from like the norse or something like that but i don't think people discuss how much how much 
how profound it is to understand that the Irish grew out of literal potatoes. Like we are like the master race because we grew from vegetables. Whereas you were made for some type of like potato chips or something like that. That's why you've got that blonde hair. We were we were from the earth. We were we were we were superior in that sense. So is um, your father an actual potato then? Is it like is Toy Story essentially the story of your father and your mother? Yes, yes, pretty much. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right, all right. Um, I, I'm. Just, not, uh, I had, I had something really good to say, but I've now forgot it because I was talking. Shit. I hope you like that, Invictus. The Irish are potatoes. That's your answer. <laughs> I, I fucking had an answer and I forgot because I was talking shit. Fuck. Um, I was talking shit. Why was I talking shit? Um. Uh, he was asking about fear of success. I usually think the fear of success is related to a fear of failure, and so my solution to that is to just to fail. Because you're afraid of succeeding because it's it's almost like um, you're playing it up in your head. I found that I've got to give this a tangible metaphor. Um, music, for example. So I would go to this new, new gig or something like that. I was going to play. I'll be performing on stage and you're getting all nervous, like being a singer as well, like front man. That's that's fucking a bit nerve wracking sometimes. And so you'd walk in and. Uh, you know, the worst thing you can do is you can say, right, I'm not going to go straight up and start making myself comfortable on the space that I'm going to go into. What I'll do is I'll go to the bar and I'll just like, uh, I'll get a drink or something like that. So you stand there, you're waiting. And while you're waiting, it's just taken away in your mind. You're like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And so what I'm doing there is procrastinating straight away. Like that's a, a, a metaphor for, or that's a, a specific example of that behavior you're trying to do i'm trying to avoid the scary place which is the stage so i go in and get that drink and it's like oh god oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck and it's just building up the tension builds up and then i get more and more nervous about going up to the stage whereas if i walk straight up and just rip the bandage off i'm fine and then um, then that, that becomes a a a fractal of what happens later then you go up on stage and you start singing now sometimes there might be a band or something like that before you or there might be people on before you and then that becomes worse because you're building it up and you're afraid and then when you go on, you might, um, when you get up and you actually start singing, you're way more nervous in, in some sense. And so sometimes you even start cooking, you start moving away from the stage, you start going, doing something else, you start walking away, you start making up excuses and all that shit. And I catch myself doing this stuff. I'm like, you're such a little bitch, go back up there. Yeah. And then what, and the days when I'm doing fine, the days when I'm doing fine is I walk, like go straight in and I go straight up onto the stage, get a comfortable space and start doing something or if I have to wait, say if there is other people playing, when I go up on stage, I just sort of go for it. And I don't really care about failing too much. And I kind of make a disaster of it, an Eminem style. You know, you like, you like uh, dox yourself in some sense. You fuck up and um, you just go for it. And you, you lose that ability to, you, you lose that obsession about self-judgment. And that eventually, um, that, that teaches you that it's just not as bad as you think. The worst, once the worst happens, it's like a liberation in some sense. And then the next time you come in, you're not, you're nowhere near as nervous and you don't feel the need to, like the procrastination, you become a lot more relaxed and then that turns into better performances in some sense. So, so whatever you're aiming at, like uh, I, I see it as a baby step thing. You've got to see, all right, what is the lowest resolution form of success I could achieve in that direction? And can I go try do it and fail? And then can I just keep at it and then fail a couple of times and build up a, an immune response to it? Because I, I find myself, what you're describing there, I think, is procrastination. And that's what I found myself doing, is that I was fear of going up there and doing it. And that's uh, I, I sort of rationalize that as this fear of success, this fear of going for it. I think it's a fear of failure, fundamentally. And so I say, fail, and then get that punch in the stomach. Like, usually it's just, like, you know, singing or some shit, so you're going to be all right. Yeah, yeah, just um, briefly there, an addendum to that. I also believe that what you're experiencing is a fear of failure. And it's interesting to consider why you would be afraid of failure. And I think it's actually a fear of death, because if you were to fail back in the old wilden times, the old tribes, if you were to fuck up in any meaningful capacity, you would either be kicked out of the tribe or you would have been murdered. And that's that's no good. But you realize that everyone has failures. But on the other side, you're still alive and you're still fine or you experience some strange form of emotion. So perhaps consider yourself in the Jungian lens, which is you are a multi, or even in the Nietzschean lens, you are a multi-component organism. And that when you fail, a part of you dies, but the core of you that's linked to your potential in the future doesn't. And so it is essentially a case of self-overcoming, becoming a Goethe type character and not being afraid to step into the fire and burning up. But perhaps uh, when you're in there, you'll realize that the fire doesn't burn you up. But in fact, there is a fourth man in the fire who is like the son of God and he will carry you through. Yes, yes.
people i'm gonna i'm gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up at that we've been tearing through this is such a fantastic book absolutely love it it's so mind-blowing it's so it, it can change the way you think so much and so i really look forward to doing the rest of this stuff we're planning to get the red book done and um, we're planning to start that soon enough as well so we'll just take us a while to get into gear for that because we're well versed with nietzsche red book's just a little bit intense so we will that, that should be coming down it's in the pipes anyway and um by all means if you enjoyed this pop on the patreon i'll leave the link in the comments below hop on the patreon drop on there you can get in on our discord you can chat to us about stuff like fear stuff like some of these questions you can get, get in and talk about anything if you want to talk about young we've just a lot of people in there and you can get in contact with us there's even some group hangouts where you can hop on on a call with myself and james and then um, like talk to us about things like this tell us what's going on in your life and all this and make this stuff practical so by all means hop in find that link join us and yes, James, any last words, sir? Yeah, only Ubermensch hop into the Discord. <laughs> only yeah. North, North FC only. That's what it is. In the stream immediately, please. <laughs> My dog is very angry with you. I'll see you later, people. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for watching.